Flying in a plane nowadays is about as safe as catching a ride on a bus or commuting on the subway. Of course, that doesn't stop people being afraid of flying. To some, the prospect of long-haul flights or feeling the shudder of turbulence are reasons to avoid planes altogether. And then, every year, there are stories of downed flights or those that go missing, all adding fuel to that aviophobia fire. Take, for example, the infamous Bermuda Triangle, that well-known region of the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean. What does that have to do with the fear of flying? Well, famously, a high number of aircraft are believed to have mysteriously vanished while flying over the Bermuda Triangle, their wreckage and passengers rarely ever recovered. Stories like that are enough to make anyone think twice about setting foot in a plane again. And then, there's SCP-787. As you may have already guessed, SCP-787 is a plane. Specifically, it is a Boeing 747-200, with a wingspan of nearly 200 feet and capable of seating over 800 passengers. The 747-200 is a part of the famous Boeing 747 family of aircraft. These are quad-engine commercial airliners, designed to be the safest ever built. The particular Boeing 747-200 that has since become known by the Foundation as SCP-787 is slightly different from one that might take you from your nearest airport to your long-awaited vacation, though. For one, SCP-787 has no known date of manufacture and no call sign, both which a standard Boeing aircraft would be expected to have. Additionally, the plane's entire exterior has been repainted. Strangely, even the windows have been painted over, and the paint was still wet when SCP-787 was first discovered. As for the inner workings, all of SCP-787's mechanical components, including its turbines, engines, and landing gear, are in perfect working order with no signs of any damage. In fact, the SCP Foundation's researchers aren't even sure that SCP-787 has actually flown since its construction. The plane's machinery looks so pristine that they might be brand new, with no detectable signs of any previous use. However, inside the main body of the plane, it seems to be a different story. Anything not mechanical, like the carpets and seats have decayed over time. Perhaps strangest of all is the cockpit. Both the pilot's and co-pilot's chairs have been replaced with two masses of computer components arranged to take the shape of two chairs. So what, you might be thinking. After all, SCP-787 is, for all intents and purposes, just an ordinary plane. Not enough to put you off flying, right? Nothing more than a Boeing with a few little things off about it, like some missing seats and decaying upholstery. Well, there's that. And then there's the over 500 dead bodies on board. In June 1987, this flight of the dead was discovered several kilometers outside of the city of Bremerton in Washington state. The SCP Foundation moved in, securing the plane and swiftly getting it into containment. Now kept within a Foundation hangar, the interior of SCP-787 is monitored for 24 hours a day. Surveillance cameras and microphones are located within the cockpit, passenger areas, and even the plane's baggage hold, with recorded footage and sound relayed back to the Foundation. The idea of a plane filled with cadavers is certainly unnerving, and more than a little creepy. But why the need for all the surveillance? After all, the bodies on board are all dead, right? Surely they're not going anywhere. Well, let's talk about those bodies. How would you expect someone to die when they are aboard a plane? Maybe they'd be thrown around during a crash landing. Or perhaps a sudden depressurization might cause the passengers to suffocate due to lack of oxygen. Under normal circumstances, you might be right. But SCP-787 is no ordinary plane, and the passengers on board were not killed in ways you might expect from any ordinary aircraft accident. Referred to by research staff as SCP-787-A specimens, the cadavers aboard this particular Boeing 747-200 all have dramatically different causes of death. Some of the specimens show signs of strangulation. Others seem to have starved or drowned. Other bodies on board have injuries like gunshot or stab wounds, while further corpses look to have died as a result of blunt force trauma. A few have even been exsanguinated, that is, completely drained of all of their blood. 
One commonality among all the specimens on board SCP-787 is that some form of mutilation has occurred. 23 passengers had their tongues removed, a further 73 were scalped, 230 had Cyrillic letters carved into their left hands, and almost 500 of the passengers had their fingertips removed. Let's recap what we have so far. First, there's the Boeing 747-200, found randomly sitting in a field. Second, it's filled with over 500 mutilated bodies. And third, each one appears to have died from a cause you wouldn't typically expect from an airline accident. Seems strange enough. But of course, then there's the apparitions and noises that manifest inside SCP-787, which is why the Foundation keeps the plane under round-the-clock surveillance so they can monitor any anomalous activity taking place aboard this flight of the dead. Any attempts by Foundation personnel to enter the plane during an anomalous occurrence have led to individuals being physically ejected from SCP-787, causing severe organ damage and internal bleeding for up to 72 hours. The anomalies that occur inside SCP-787 range from the presence of loud noises with no obvious source, to the manifestation of strange human-shaped entities within the plane. The first anomalous occurrence recorded within SCP-787 was in 1988, when the sound of a loud pounding was heard against the doors and windows of the plane's left side. Two years later, a male voice could be heard from the onboard bathroom, repeating a singular phrase over and over. Philosophers always run from the advanced thickening treatment. In 1993, the plane's in-flight entertainment system seemed to be activated by itself. The overhead screen showed a bizarre choice of in-flight movie. Colorless pictures of a deceased man, accompanied by a female voice reading a gynecology book in Czech. The same year, the longest lasting of the SCP-787 anomalies took place. This time, the plane's fastened seatbelt sign spent almost four hours flickering while the first 15 seconds of Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit played on a loop over the onboard speakers. It wasn't until 1997 that the first of the humanoid entities appeared aboard SCP-787. This figure was indistinct, lacking any discernible detail, little more than just a human shape standing in the aisles. Observed by the Foundation's surveillance equipment, the figure was seen removing an emergency oxygen supply and mask from seat H-43. It stood perfectly still, wearing the passenger's breathing mask for over two minutes before removing the mask and disappearing from the view of the cameras placed on board. The figure did not appear anywhere else inside the plane. Another figure appeared four years later in 2001, sitting in the mass of computer parts that made up the co-pilot's chair. This figure, much like its predecessor, was indistinct in its features. For almost four minutes, it sat in the cockpit of the Boeing 747-200, just whimpering softly. Then it lurched forward, vomiting all over the console in front of it, before quickly disappearing like the first figure. SCP personnel collected a sample of the vomit the entity left behind. After performing an analysis of the sample, research staff found traces of nitrous oxide, thorium, bird droppings, and three human fingernails. At present, the origin of these humanoid figures is still unknown. Could these entities be the souls of the dead passengers, trying to offer insight into what happened aboard this flight? Or perhaps these indistinct human-shaped creatures are the ones responsible for the deaths of SCP-787's passengers? The next anomaly within SCP-787 occurred in 2005 when a female voice was recorded speaking through the onboard speaker system. The voice said, For your comfort and enjoyment today, pancakes will now be served. Please do not leave your seat. Pancakes will now be served. Please do not leave your seat. Do not leave your seat. Leave your seat. Please. Pancakes will now be served. Yay! Pancakes. Exactly what the relevance of pancakes are to a plane full of bodies is still under investigation by the SCP Foundation. Next, in 2007, the Boeing's overhead emergency air masks fell from the ceiling, only to be snatched back upwards. They continued deploying and retracting for 14 minutes, while the plane was simultaneously filled with the noise of screams. Finally, the only other notable anomaly took place a year later, when the onboard temperature with an SCP-787 dropped 33 degrees from 20 to minus 13 Celsius in a matter of seconds. By the late 2000s, the Foundation's researchers was having little luck understanding the nature of SCP-787's anomalies. Instead, they turned their attention to identifying the bodies of the deceased passengers on board. 
through the use of advanced forensics and population databases. These researchers attempted to determine where exactly these bodies had come from. Researchers still haven't determined if they all died on the plane, or if someone had exhumed them from graves before placing them aboard for some unknown reason. In fact, the answer was neither, and Foundation researchers discovered something that no one had expected. One of the passengers was still alive. To clarify, the body aboard SCP-787 was definitely still deceased, but researchers identified the cadaver as a retired optometrist from Atlanta, Georgia, who is still very much alive. Foundation agents found the man was simultaneously alive and well in his Atlanta home, but also dead on board the Boeing 747-200. The subject was interviewed by agents and had no prior knowledge of any incident taking place in June 1987 when SCP-787 was first discovered. Even more interestingly, he claimed that he never even set foot aboard an airplane, which his wife and son both confirmed to be true. So what does this mean? How could the same man have been alive in Georgia and dead aboard SCP-787? Perhaps the answer can be found in a surprising place. The plane's toilet. Or to be more specific, the place where the things flushed in the toilet go to. Examinations of the airplane's waste storage tank have revealed something very surprising. There was one more SCP-787-A specimen that had been overlooked. It is unknown just how he got in there, but researchers discovered the body of an Indian man who looked to be in his 30s. The man, who was wearing a three-piece suit, was found to be carrying a number of puzzling items, including a surgical mask and gloves an unloaded Beretta DT-10 shotgun, several cinnamon-flavored mints, a switchblade knife, an amulet that appears to depict the Eye of Horus, and a ticket stub for the Return of the Jedi with the number 92 written on the back. All of these objects seem to be completely random, and the Foundation has been unable to make sense of what they were doing on the man, or why his body does not seem to show the same state of decay as the rest of those found on board. There was one item that may hold some answers, though. For some reason, this man also possessed a copy of SCP-787's flight log. The log consisted of a series of coordinates, which were repeated 5,478 times. The coordinates point to a seemingly random spot in the Pacific Ocean, several hundred miles away from the infamous Pitcairn Islands, the island that the famous mutineers of the HMS Bounty settled after taking over the ship and leaving the captain adrift on the ocean. Is this location the secret to SCP-787? While none of this is confirmed nor denied by anyone at the SCP Foundation, one theory surrounding the area is that the location is another Bermuda Triangle-like location, one that contains some sort of temporal anomaly that unwitting planes fly through, only to find themselves displaced in time. Of course, the problem with this theory is that the man from Atlanta said he'd never been aboard a plane before. Or at least, not yet. It is entirely possible that SCP-787 is a plane that made a flight at some point in the not-too-distant future, only to arrive back in June 1987 by passing through a temporal breach in the area near the Pitcairn Islands. Sure, it might not explain what happened to everyone on board, but it could at least explain how SCP-787 arrived where and when it did. Every plane is fitted with a device that records flight data, in the event of a crash or other accident, known to most as the plane's black box, and researchers were able to uncover SCP-787s inside a compartment under one of the plane's seats. The recorder was found within a compartment filled with toxic asbestos and dried human blood. They hoped that perhaps it would contain some answers as to what exactly SCP-787 had come from and what had happened to its passengers. Sadly not. The flight data recorder contained no information besides one simple phrase, to be sorry. While an inexplicable mystery, SCP-787 is at least classified as a safe anomaly by the Foundation, seeing as it poses no realistic threat or shows signs of trying to break out of containment. The aircraft has only ever caused harm to anyone trying to enter during one of its sporadic anomalous events, but apart from that, it sits gathering dust in a hangar, just waiting for someone to crack its secrets. And who knows, maybe one day you'll be sitting on a plane that's taking you to your South Pacific vacation, and the retired optometrist sitting next to you will remark that you're passing over the Pitcairn Islands, and you'll discover for yourself exactly what happened to SCP-787. Working at the SCP Foundation might just be the most exciting job a person can ask for. And by exciting, we mean that if you work as an SCP field operative, researcher, or mobile task force member, 
you're much more likely to die a horrific death on the job than, say, a plumber. But at least you get the honor of proudly saying that you're the first line of defense between the normal world and the terrifying domain of the anomalous. Well, unless you're one of the IT guys. Then your work life is likely as tedious and uneventful as the computer tech guy working on the Geek Squad. But nothing is ever normal when it comes to the SCP Foundation, where even the person whose job is helping other staff members reset their email passwords may run into the supernatural. Welcome to the strange and frightening world of Pattern Screamers, and specifically, SCP-000. SCP-000 was first discovered completely on accident by technical researcher David Rosen, a man intrinsically connected to the pattern screamers lurking on the SCP Foundation computer database. Technical researcher Rosen is actually somewhat of a celebrity around the Foundation staff, due to the fact that he's so perfectly mediocre at what he does. His job as the glorified IT guy at the SCP Foundation was previously held by the more qualified researcher Patrick Gephardt, but Rosen was called in to replace him after Gephardt mysteriously disappeared while on the job. Since 2012, Rosen has been Site-19's user-level tech support wizard, but the best thing that can really be said about his job competency is that he's got a 100% attendance record. He seems to live out of his office, which is described as the filthiest at the whole foundation. Every inch of the floor is covered in old, broken computer parts, and the air is stale with dust and the twin odors of sweat and lithium grease. It's a place so inhospitable that the Foundation has seriously considered bottling the stench as a kind of chemical deterrent. While Technical Director Rosen isn't good at his job per se, he isn't technically bad enough at it to justify the time and resources it would take to replace him. But the worst part about Rosen isn't his performance, it's his truly rotten attitude. He's universally described by his colleagues as being rude, grumpy, and combative with patience that's far too short for someone working in tech support. And while Rosen does have a real fear that the ghost of Researcher Gephardt is stalking him, he was about to have his first actual brush with the supernatural. It all started when he began receiving automated repair tickets for SCP-000, a file that had no reason to exist. As any longtime follower of the SCP Foundation will know, the universal designation for the first cluster of SCPs to be discovered is SCP-001. There is no SCP-000. It simply doesn't exist. And when Rosen first found the file lurking on the database, he found that it was filled with worthless nonsense. The object class was recorded as null. The special containment procedures read, Error. Field. Containment underscore procedures does not exist and the mess of a description simply read, Internal System Error, Field Undefined. Please contact System Administrator over and over again, becoming more mangled and nonsensical each time. Technical Director Rosen, who could never resist an opportunity to complain, decided to leave an angry administrator's note on the useless file. He claimed that this pile of junk data was sending out pointless repair tickets because of its broken syntax clogging up the system and preventing him from doing actual work on meaningful files. He assumed that this was all down to the database not knowing how to react to having files logged with insufficient information, and he suppressed all future repair tickets from SCP-000 before declaring the matter over and done with. What the pig-headed technical director didn't realize was that he was suppressing a call for help from an entity trapped in the white space below the article itself. It was a being born into a pure white world of absolute nothingness, an entity with no name and no place, but it was somehow capable of thought. Its panicked inner monologue is readable in the hidden text which takes the form of a rambling stream of consciousness. The being first described coming to life in this empty world with no memories of where it was or even how it got there. It spent what could have been years exploring the empty wasteland, Occasionally, it would see horrific monsters pop up around it, but only for a split second. The entity continued to wander, and little by little, the existential dread mounted, as it realized that it may truly be stuck here in oblivion forever. The entity only had one word to go on, a word repeated by some of the monsters it encountered. Foundation. The entity had no idea what this foundation even was, but it grew to hate 
and fear it. Was this foundation the one that trapped it here? The entity had all the time in the world to speculate on it. Eventually, the entity found its voice. Like any sentient creature in trouble, it began to call for help, eventually screaming, just hoping someone would notice it. These pleas likely translated into the frequent IT repair tickets, a coded SOS, an attempt to show that everything was not as it appeared on the SCP-000 file. Perhaps the entity may have found help if researcher Gephardt was still working at the Foundation, but instead its cries fell on the ignorant ears of technical director Rosen. It may as well have been speaking to a brick wall. Rosen, who had all the investigative zeal of Paul Blart Malkop, made sure that these cries would never lead to the entity's freedom when he suppressed the repair tickets. He had trapped the entity in a private blank hell, forever hating a life it didn't choose and could never escape. A relentless, existential nightmare. This is the gist of your average pattern screamer. Pattern screamers are a perfect example of literally making something out of nothing. They are often a kind of floating consciousness, created from nothing, trapped in pockets of nothingness between the fabric of reality, driven mad by the purgatory-like nature of their existence. They're less living entities and more conceptual constructs, pure ideas, that just happen to be self-aware of their own existence in their private hellish voids. The SCP-00 file, a file for an anomaly that doesn't exist and thus had no reason to exist, is a perfect breeding ground for a pattern screamer. But sadly for the pattern screamer in question, technical director Rosen had no idea. This isn't the only time that Rosen had run into a pattern screamer without even knowing either. And just like the first case, he was with no help whatsoever. This one began with SCPS, an otherwise empty file containing only this image. Director Winters, a Foundation administrator, wondered why this file even existed. Enter Technical Director Rosen, filled with equal parts sarcasm and insubordination. He gave a condescending reply to Director Winters, saying that the file was there to test the filing system, and the image was likely just a placeholder. Winters never should have been on the page anyway, according to Rosen. Director Winters was annoyed at Rosen's typically rude tone, and asked him to make the purpose of the article clearer in the article itself. In response, Rosen did as he was told, filling the article in the most sarcastic manner possible. The whole thing was essentially a middle finger to Director Winters for having the audacity to even ask. Rosen signed off with, There. Finished. I certainly hope I have been clear enough to anyone who may have accidentally accessed this page, through what I am sure is no fault of their own, so we won't have any more incredibly competent directors bugging the tech team about this page. And once again, technical researcher Rosen was too busy being a rude, unpleasant jerk to notice he was practically staring another pattern screamer in the face. This pattern screamer, or rather, hive of pattern screamers, were trapped even deeper than the one in SCP-000. This one was hidden in the very source code of SCPS, where a chorus of enraged voices screamed the following, Pretend, monster, just for a minute. Pretend you were the size of an amoeba, dwarfed by even the smallest of bugs. Pretend you didn't hold the world in a glass cage. Pretend you were the one being held by something greater than yourself. Would you still be laughing at your triumphs? Would you still feel pride in what you were, even as pitifully small as you would be? Of course you would, because you are arrogant and stupid. If you haven't guessed yet, we hate you. This pattern screamer is clearly more aware of its pitiful station in existence than the 000 pattern screamer, and as a result, it's not so much depressed as it is furious. Though at this point, you've probably figured out that even the entities who have the most casual brushes with technical researcher Rosen end up getting infuriated. But while you may have gotten the impression that all pattern screamers are sad little entities worthy of our sympathy and pity, there's at least one pattern screamer that's actually incredibly dangerous. This is SCP-3930, the ultimate pattern screamer, in terms of both size and effect. It's an anomaly so strange it defies typical containment classification, and it bears a level 5 security lock, meaning only those on the level of the legendary O5 Council are cleared to even know about it. Its greatest containment procedure is the preservation of the very idea that SCP-3930 does not exist. 
because the alternative has terrifying implications for all involved. SCP-3930 is a one-kilometer area in Russia that is filled with non-existence. To even call it a white void would be inaccurate, because it implies the existence of the color white and the existence of the concept of a void. Nothing exists within SCP-3930, and anyone who directly observes 3930 runs the risk of actively increasing its power. That's why special containment procedures dictate that anyone who observes 3930 must be forced to walk into it afterwards, which results in them ceasing to exist. They're destroyed on the deepest level that anything can be destroyed. The very idea of them ceases to be. Another reason that SCP-3930 is so special is that, because it's the largest area of nothing in existence interacting directly with our reality, it's the only place that a huge number of pattern screamers can be directly observed by humans. They're described as being like sentient hallucinations. One researcher suggests that these pattern screamers are created by the way the psyche shatters when brought into contact with raw, true nothingness. The nothingness acts like a hateful mirror to our worst thoughts, reflecting them back at us in the forms of restless screamers. Regardless of what they actually are, one thing is for sure. Coming into direct contact with one of these screamers is a harrowing experience. In the end, it just goes to show that pattern screamers are a complex entity. They can range from microscopic to massive, from pitiful to downright terrifying. And the sad result is that, in either case, nothing can really be done to stop them. It's just as impossible to stop the nothingness existing in SCP-3930 as it is to save the entity trapped in the white spaces of SCP-000. Maybe the best option is to actually be more like Technical Director Rosen. Keep your head down, focus instead on your own petty worries, and bask in the warm bliss that can only come with having no idea what you're dealing with. The one downside is that this may make you a pretty lousy IT guy. There are some things human beings aren't meant to know, and it's the sworn duty of the SCP Foundation to discover and contain such information. But sometimes knowledge is discovered that shakes even the Foundation itself to its very core. One such discovery occurred on April 28, 2016. That night, SCP-2935 made itself known to the Foundation personnel. To this day, the exact nature of SCP-2935 is a mystery that even the Foundation's brightest minds can't completely understand. Everything we know about SCP-2935 today comes from three doomed missions to the anomalous zone's interior. This is the story of those infamous expeditions. The nightmare began around 5 a.m. when SCP Foundation Site 81 in Bloomingdale, Indiana intercepted a distorted radio signal. Communications personnel at the site traced this strange signal back to the unincorporated area of Joppa, Indiana, near U.S. Interstate 70. As is Foundation policy, a team of field agents were dispatched to the location in order to determine what they were dealing with. However, rather than finding anything that could logically produce such a signal, they instead discovered a long abandoned cemetery. The most recent death on any of the tombstones was recorded as being over a hundred years ago, all the way back in 1908. On further investigation, the Foundation discovered an unmapped limestone cave opening beneath the cemetery, and when they sent a drone into the depths of the cave, it appeared to quickly exit out the other side of the cave. But something wasn't right. The area that the drone was observing appeared consistent with the landscape from which it entered, but now it looked somehow grayer. It lacked the color of life of the place it just come from. The grass was dead, there were no trees, no shrubs, no animals, or birds in the sky. They weren't looking at our world, they were looking at a strange reflection of our world on the other side of the cave. In fact, it wasn't a cave at all, it was a passageway between two dimensions. It was SCP-2935. Just then, they were able to unscramble the distorted transmission they'd been receiving. It went as follows. This is an automated emergency broadcast from the SCP Foundation and your national government. One or more of our sites is experiencing a communication breakdown, likely due to a containment breach of unknown magnitude. All citizens are ordered to stay in their homes as containment teams work to secure the breach. This message will broadcast from April 20, 2016 until… At that point, the message would cut and repeat, as it had for eight straight days. The message source? Site 81, but not this Site 81. The SCP Foundation was receiving an emergency distress signal from themselves in another dimension, a bizarre event that even the Foundation had never experienced before. 
Field agents were terrified by the implications of what they just heard and contacted Site 81 Command to request additional units. The Foundation wished to fully understand this anomaly as quickly as possible due to the potential threat it could pose toward the Foundation, so they dispatched Mobile Task Force Epsilon 13, codenamed Manifest Destiny, to perform the first of three manned missions into the heart of the anomalous zone. The first exploratory mission into SCP-2935 was codenamed Gauntlet and consisted of a four-man team fitted with full hazmat suits and direct video and audio links to Mission Command. The team was led by a field operative known only as Agent Juno. His subordinates were Agents Kale, Devon, and Underwood. Their directive was to gather samples and survey the area positioned directly around the insertion point, meaning the other cave mouth of SCP-2935. The mission only lasted about an hour, but what they saw in there would stay with these men for the rest of their lives. After a 15-minute trek through the cave, Manifest Destiny arrived in the mirror dimension, where they were struck by the eerie silence of a place that seemed identical and yet so different from their home dimension. The first observation they made was the total absence of all living vegetation. Trees, grass, weeds, everything, it was all dead. On orders from their superiors back in the original dimension, that we'll refer to from here on as Dimension Prime, Manifest Destiny headed deeper into the mirror dimension of SCP-2935. They traveled two kilometers without detecting a single sign of plant or animal life, not even insects. Eventually, they came upon a farmhouse with two cars parked outside. With authorization from command, Manifest Destiny breached the house and headed inside. Agent Kale confirmed that there was still power flowing to the building as the lighting appeared to work just fine, but they came upon a horrifying discovery in the house's dining room. Three adult corpses, two female, one male, were seated at the table. A fourth corpse, that of a male child, was sprawled out on the ground nearby. As if the death of what looked to be an entire family wasn't awful enough, the Manifest Destiny team noticed a number of other alarming details. There were no signs of decomposition on the bodies, nor did there appear to be any obvious cause of death. The family's last meal was still on the table, chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans. While the food looked cold and stale, there was no evidence of rot or spoiling. The team found an open newspaper dated April 19, 2016, illustrating that the family may have died a full eight days before the discovery. In Dimension Prime, decay would already be very well underway by that point, yet here there wasn't even a smell. Instead, everything was just covered in a thin layer of dust. Command requested that Manifest Destiny collect samples of the food as well as hair, skin, and fluids from the corpses for further study. Small electronics like smartphones were also taken from the bodies. Agent Devon turned on the television in the living room and found that while most stations were now running test signals, the shopping channel was still live. Well, the feed was live at least. Both hosts sat in front of the cameras dead, but perfectly preserved. The date on the screen read April 28, 2016 suggesting that the times of Dimension Prime and Mirror Dimension were exactly the same. In fact, everything seemed the same, the only difference between the two dimensions being that some kind of mysterious apocalyptic event had occurred in the last eight days in SCP-2935's Mirror Dimension, but exactly what had happened or how remained a mystery. When Manifest Destiny exited the farmhouse, they once again remarked on the lack of all signs of life around them. At this point, the team returned to the insertion point of SCP-2935, but were instructed to remain in the mirror dimension while additional units joined them inside. Manifest Destiny swelled to 16 members, with the notable addition of Agent Roy as the new commanding field officer. The team split into two groups of eight, and Agent Roy and his men infiltrated the mirror dimension Site-81, while Agent Juno's detachment attempted to access the base's off-site deep storage servers. This second expedition was codenamed Overland and led the Foundation's field agents even deeper into the terrifying mystery of SCP-2935. Accessing the site was easy for Roy's detachment. It seemed there were relatively few cars on the road at the time of the mysterious extinction event. In the distance, fire still smoldered in the wreckage of planes that looked to have just dropped out of the sky. Agent Roy and his team, like all SCP Foundation personnel, were fitted with vitals trackers, and they assumed that the distress signal that started this whole thing could have been triggered by the deaths of every member of the Foundation at once once in the mirror universe. Once inside Site-81, they realized that the assumption was probably right. Going door to door in the administrative wing, they found the perfectly preserved corpses of everyone they knew to be stationed there in Dimension Prime, people who were without a doubt still alive in their universe. Samples from the corpses that the Foundation would later study even confirmed the reason that the bodies were perfectly preserved. The corpses had experienced complete and sudden death on a cellular level, and even the bacteria that would typically take part in the decomposition process had died with it. 
In SCP-2935, death was total and absolute across all types of life forms. As Agent Roy's team ventured further into the bowels of Site-81, they made another unsettling discovery. Their own corpses, in roughly the same spots they'd been inside Dimension Prime Site-81 eight days prior. Some of the Foundation's top scientists, including the esteemed Dr. Bright, were also found dead inside the facility. In an attempt to see just how far this unexplained phenomenon stretched, Agent Roy's team decided to inspect the containment cells, where they found that all the Mirror Universe's SCPs, including SCP-2996, were dead. In his desperation to find some kind of exception to the extinction event, Agent Roy revealed a terrifying secret to the rest of his team. SCP-682, the immortal misanthropic lizard and one of the deadliest creatures known to the SCP Foundation, was contained at this very facility right below them. Could it have something to do with what was going on here? They descended into the containment facility to discover an even more unsettling truth. SCP-682, the unkillable anomaly, floated dead in its tank. Death truly made no exceptions within SCP-2935. Agent Roy's team left the site and rendezvoused with Agent Juno's team to send their research back to Dimension Prime using automated drones. Both teams remained in the mirror dimension for another manned operation codenamed 19. They had no idea it would be their final mission. As they descended deeper into the facility, passing more dead SCPs, they discovered one final clue. Based on the activity of the Foundation servers, the event occurred at roughly 3 a.m. While underground in SCP-2935 Site-81, the team accidentally activated the base's on-site nuclear weapon, a failsafe meant to be detonated in the case of an emergency containment breach. Due to the base's failsafe protocols, every member of the Manifest Destiny team was locked and sealed inside Site-81. They, along with everything else, were incinerated in the nuclear blast. Once again, the mirror universe inside of SCP-2935 was lifeless. But that isn't where it ends. When the automated drones returned out of the SCP-2935 cave to the field operations in Dimension Prime, they were in for their own horrifying discovery. None of the footage or information gathered from SCP-2935 illuminated how or why the extinction event occurred. Everyone and everything simply dropped dead at the exact same moment. Nobody was aware, nobody was prepared. Death came suddenly and silently, and none were spared. All the Foundation on Dimension Prime were left with was a message from one of the agents from Manifest Destiny, Agent Keller. His final message was, I don't have any answers. I don't think there are any. I'll do this one thing and hope that fixes it. Seal it shut. You've got to lock it in here with us. I'm sorry. The Foundation were at first confused by this until they discovered a final encrypted audio log buried in the files recovered from the Mirror Universe's Site-81. It was a message from Keller himself, but not the Keller from Universe Prime. In this message, Keller described the Foundation in the Mirror Universe, receiving the exact same distorted transmission that they did a few days earlier from a cave in Joppa. When he and the others were dispatched inside, they discovered the same lifeless post-extinction event world that was now so familiar to the Foundation Command. But there was a key difference. This wasn't the mirror dimension they'd just been studying, but a third, entirely different dimension. In his haunting final words, Mirror Dimension Keller admits that whatever caused the event in that third dimension, an entity in that Mirror Dimension Keller believed this was the specter of death itself and had followed him back into his world, and history had repeated itself. SCP-2935 was the passageway through which absolute death could pass from dimension to dimension, and our dimension was the next in line. The deaths of Manifest Destiny may have saved our entire universe, as anyone passing back through the cave had the potential to bring death itself back with them. The Foundation decided in the end to follow Keller's advice. They sealed the entrance to SCP-2935 with concrete and now kept it under constant watch since what waits behind the barrier is an entity even they have no power to stop if it ever got through. After all, it had killed them all before, or at least another version of them. What's one more dimension on the pile? Why it may now just seem like a simple slab of concrete under an abandoned cemetery, this is why SCP-2935 might be the most dangerous SCP of all. A veteran worker of the SCP Foundation sits at his terminal, performing one of the most critical tasks in the entire organization creating a file for an as-yet undescribed SCP. But there's something terribly wrong. His eyes are glazed over. His mouth hangs open. Is this a zombie or a trained Foundation researcher? What is going on? Like any large international organization, it takes more than just the exciting, action-filled jobs to keep the wheels turning at the SCP Foundation. Sure, the head researchers, guards, mobile task force soldiers, and members of the O5 Command get all the praise, 
but a legion of number crunchers, cleaners, and paper pushers are equally important. One such person was archivist Walter Bainbridge, who had been tasked with digitizing some of the older records that the Foundation had on file. It was when he was innocently recording the details on SCP-050 through 060 that he first came under the strange and startling effects of SCP-055. But the most peculiar part, as with all incidents of SCP-055's anomalous effects taking hold, is that Walter had no idea any of it was happening. In his new digitized filing system, he first took note of SCP-053, Euclid class, also known as the young girl. This anomaly was a seemingly normal human female child who provoked homicidal insanity in those directly exposed to her. Then SCP-054, safe class, a non-aggressive humanoid female made entirely of, as well as biologically and chemically identical to regular spring water. Next, SCP-056, Euclid class, a being that changes form to suit its environment, but only when all observers lose focus of it. And then, SCP-057, safe class, an underground chamber that crushes the humans who walk within. It was at this point that Walter received a concerned message from one of his superiors at Site-19, Mr. Kovach. The message praised the thorough digitization of the other anomalies' records, but was confused about why Walter had left out any mention of SCP-055. Immediately, Walter was embarrassed. How could he have forgotten SCP-055, that iconic anomaly known for… well, he couldn't quite say off the top of his head, but he'd be sure to look into it. A quick trip to the Site-19 archive showed him that there was actually quite a hefty file on the nature of SCP-055, which must have been the result of a huge number of studies. What struck him as strange was that all the files were filled out in pen rather than being typed up like a traditional file. The majority of these notes were written in shorthand, too, as though they were frantically taken during the tests themselves on extremely short notice. There weren't even any redactions. Walter made a mental note of what he had seen, put the file back in its proper place, and headed back to his computer terminal. However, after writing in an almost trance-like state, he looked back on his work to see that he had written an entry on SCP-058, a giant evil bovine heart with insect legs and a scorpion stinger. Strange, he thought. That's when Walter got a call from Mr. Kovach on his Foundation issue phone, and he didn't sound happy. He'd given Walter direct instructions to go back and digitize the files on 055, and instead he'd been working on 058. What was the meaning of this? Walter was typically an extremely loyal and diligent employee, but the verbal barrage from his supervisor had him considering talking back, just this once, and hoping it didn't get him demoted to D-Class and thrown into 682's acid bath for playtime. Walter gulped picked up some courage, and interrupted Mr. Kovach's rant to ask if he had any idea what SCP-055 actually was. The line went silent for a moment, then his supervisor spoke again, this time with less confidence. Uh, of course I can tell you about SCP-055. Uh, it's a classic, one of the first hundred. How could you forget it's, uh, or, yeah, you know, it's, I think it's the one with, um, Another long pause as Mr. Kovach seemed to search for the words, but instead just trailed off into silence. Knowing that some of the anomalies on file were dangerous mimetic hazards, Walter was worried for a moment that he may have accidentally killed his boss by getting him to think too hard about SCP-055. He asked if Mr. Kovach was okay, and finally got a reply. I'm sorry, I seem to have zoned out for a second there. What were we talking about again? But this time it was Walter who couldn't answer. He had no idea at all what the two of them were discussing just moments ago. He felt disoriented and kind of sick, like they'd taken some low-level amnestics. Mr. Kovach told Walter to get back to his filing duties and they'd speak later. Walter then checked the messages he'd received from Mr. Kovach earlier, and there it was, plain as day. You missed 055. Go back and digitize that before proceeding, Mr. K. But Walter had never even heard of an SCP-055 if such an anomaly even existed. What was going on here? In that moment, Walter realized he was dealing with something much stranger than just a standard digitization job. After all, 
How could he properly complete his duties if SCP-055 seemed to be impossible to speak, write, or even think about, unless you were directly observing it at that moment? Walter had to know, and ask around the entirety of Site-19 to find the answers if he had to. Sadly for Walter, he was about to embark on a much more challenging task than he could have ever imagined. To paraphrase a supposed quote from Socrates, All I know is that I know nothing. And that's also about the extent of the knowledge we have on SCP-055, also known as the anti-meme and the self-keeping secret. What does it look like? When and how was it obtained by the Foundation? What are its anomalous abilities? Is this thing dangerous? We may never know. Because the only anomalous ability of SCP-055 that we're aware of is the fact that nobody is capable of retaining any information about it. It's crucial to note that whatever 055 is, it isn't invisible or indescribable. Foundation personnel are perfectly capable of entering its containment chamber and observing it without incident. But mere minutes after leaving the chamber, any memories of the particulars of 055 seem to spontaneously erase themselves. Hence, the self-keeping secret. But this didn't deter Walter. Perhaps his greatest advantage was that he didn't know enough about the thing he was investigating to know how futile his mission was. He wanted to know the unknowable. And a pesky issue like impossibility wouldn't stop him. He'd get to whoever he needed to at Site-19 to get the answers he needed. Of course, most people had no knowledge of the mysterious anomaly. The common response he got back from his colleagues was, 055? Do we even have a 055? While the realization of sudden memory loss, or the realization of 055's existence, has been known to cause momentary stress, there are no known long-term physical or mental effects from 055's anomalous abilities. It's a fleeting idea in its purest form, like forgetting why you walked into a room. 055 could be the most harmless object on the Foundation's roster, or the most deadly. Either way, we just don't know. At times, Walter worried he was going insane. 055 and everything related to it was gaslighting him. Was 055 even real? The one thing that proved to him that 055 must have existed is that its containment chamber existed. According to the official records kept by the Foundation on the Site-19 containment facilities, 055 is kept in a 5x5 five by, five by 2.5 meter square room constructed of 50-foot thick cement, with a Faraday cage surrounding the cement walls. The report continues that, Access is via a heavy containment door measuring 2 by 2.5 meters, constructed on bearings to ensure door closes and locks automatically unless held open deliberately. 055 cell is one of the few to have no posted security guards, and any personnel working on other SCPs in the area are ordered to remain at least 50 feet from the geometric center of 055 cell, where the anomaly itself is kept. When he tried to explore further why the cell was constructed in this manner, he found that, surprise, surprise, nobody knew. 055 was an anomaly whose containment requirements were so mysterious that it automatically netted itself a Keter-class designation. After all, how can you properly contain something you can't even hope to comprehend? There were plenty of rumors about the true nature of 055. Some of the more conspiratorial minds at Site-19 theorized that 055 was actually an autonomous or remotely controlled spy inserted into the site to observe Foundation operations, or even humanity as a whole. If you're on the more paranoid end of the psychological spectrum, this theory makes total sense. An anomaly that's physically impossible to remember, even when writings and pictures on the subject exist, would be a perfect spy. However, this was all ultimately little more than speculation. Walter was barely any further along than when he started. There were multiple points in his investigations where Walter seriously considered giving up. Until finally, he had a major breakthrough. Dr. Bartholomew Hughes and Dr. John Marichek were two scientists that had performed extensive research into 055, and who, Walter hoped, might have the answers he sought about the self-keeping secret. These scientists were the first to discover the anti-memetic nature of 055, performing numerous tests on D-Class personnel to see if it was possible to create feasible written records 
sketches, or any other records or impressions that could bypass its anomalous effects. The disorienting, memory-ruining effects of 055 also extend to any materials concerning 055. It seems to be a truly uncrackable code, but Dr. Hughes may have finally found some cracks in the armor. For starters, the fact that we're able to remember that 055 is an anti-memetic is an ironic exception to its anti-memetic qualities. This revelation also inspired another realization from Dr. Hughes. Would it be possible to discover more about 055 from the process of deduction rather than the typical induction? In other words, could they possibly learn about 055 by figuring out all the things it isn't rather than what it is? Dr. Marichek designed an experiment with Dr. Hughes to explore this theory. They designed the experiment around a simple question. Is 055 not spherical? In designing the question to specifically find out what 055 isn't, they hoped to subvert the anomaly's anti-memetic powers. Walter was fascinated by this potential method of getting answers. Marichek and Hughes found that, while the questioning process for those exposed was often arduous and frustrating, they could now definitely say that 055 is not a sphere. It is theoretically possible to discover the true nature of 055 by an almost endless barrage of deductive questions, though whether command would authorize the resources for such extensive testing is still an open question. Walter, in his desperation, begged Marichek and Hughes for clearance to view 055 himself. The curiosity had become too great during a search to just walk away with the single fact that 055 wasn't spherical. He needed to see this thing. And after several weeks of filling out forms and cutting red tape, his wish was finally granted. Walter Bainbridge was allowed a private audience with SCP-055, the subject of his months-long obsession. Outsiders observed that Walter spent just over an hour in the containment chamber, taking photos, drawing sketches, writing down notes, recording audio logs, and reciting memory mnemonics. He was pulling out every stop to counteract the anti-memetic effects of the self-keeping secret. He was adamant that he would not be defeated by his non-spherical nemesis, not after all this time and effort. Once his time in the 055 containment chamber was over, he retired back to his office to finally digitize his exhaustive findings, so that his supervisor Mr. Kovach would finally get off his back. Walter smiled, took a deep breath, and began to type. SCP-059, Keter class. This anomaly is a radioactive mineral that emits a unique radiation known as delta radiation. Exposure to this radiation has caused strange fungal growths on the infected... Wait, what was this supposed to be about again? Oh well, it couldn't have been that important. It was November 20th, 2019, and the helicopter circled far above in the freezing wind of the Antarctic. SCP Foundation Site Director Jason Monroe looked down at the isolated, mm. above-ground facilities of Provisional Site 344-1. Something about this place made him nervous, edgy, and for good reason. Between 2003 and 2019, 29 mobile task force units and 73 members of D-Class personnel had gone missing here and never been found. Monroe thought he was here for a routine investigation into negligence and mismanagement, but little did he know, he was in for so much more. This is the story of SCP-5545 and one man's journey into his own worst nightmare, literally. But this nightmare began a long time ago, 300 years to be exact. And like most nightmares, it started as a dream. That dream was one of expansion. National powers across Europe wanted to be the first to conquer the globe and expand into new territories, and sent countless exploratory missions off into the unknown to achieve this goal. Any history book will tell you that the first outsiders to lay eyes upon the continent of Antarctica did so in 1820. The reality is that the first ones to get there actually landed in the late 1700s. The hapless explorers ventured into mainland Antarctica and made base camps, before searching and digging for any useful resources nearby. They came upon a strange discovery, a hallway hidden beneath the ice. Not a passage in the ice, but a true hallway, complete with light fixtures. The confused explorers ventured down into these impossible hallways, and for many of them, it would be the last thing they ever did. No matter how long they walked, 
It seemed like the hallways just kept going. As they continued to walk for hours, they hoped to find something, anything. And eventually, they did. They passed from these hallways into somewhere different altogether, and most of them were never heard from again. Those who did manage to escape often died or took their own lives soon after. Whatever it was they discovered down there, they didn't want to live with it on their minds. It's believed that over 70 colonial explorers disappeared or died this way, and that most who found these endless hallways beneath the Antarctic ice never returned. The multiple anomalous objects and phenomena that make up SCP-5545 came into the Foundation's hands several centuries later, on September 18, 2003, when during an expedition into the Antarctic, they too found the endless hallways. The Foundation built Provisional Site 344-1 around them, hoping to safely seal them off from any other unwitting Antarctic explorers or researchers. But there was something else lurking beneath the ice in Antarctica, something dangerous. The hallways were designated as SCP-5545-1 and were thought to be the extent of the anomalous activity at the site. But soon SCP-5545-2 was discovered, which resulted in the deaths of 16 researchers. So what exactly is 5545-2? It's an entity so volatile that even knowing about it is considered to be a containment breach. And, as a result, it's kept in Provisional Site 344-2. Unlike Site 344-1, 344-2 isn't a physical space. It's conceptual, accessible only through the endless hallways, created with the express purpose of keeping 5545-1 and 5545-2 separate. Why? Because whenever the two come into contact, the result is 5545-3, the network of endless hallways expanding. If they remained in contact, the hallways would continue to expand and the entire planet could be filled with endless hallways in just four to six hours. While the two are apart though, 5545-3 reverses, but it always would take just a few hours to throw the whole world into a chaos of infinite hallways. SCP-5545 has been given the classification safe, Wait, we're dealing with a mysterious and volatile anomaly that claimed a huge number of lives and still somehow eludes true Foundation understanding, yet the official SCP Foundation classification is safe? How could this be? Monroe was the director of Site 58 and was the definition of no nonsense. Prior to taking the site director position, he was a decorated member of Mobile Task Force Ada 10 and helped contain numerous Keter class anomalies. He'd been around the proverbial block when it came to anomalous activity, and something about SCP-5545 and the management of Provisional Site 344 seemed awfully suspicious to him, and he had questions. Like how such an unpredictable anomaly could be declared safe, and why had there been such a lapse of communication between the Foundation and Dr. Gabriel Reed, who'd been running the facility for the past two decades, and most of all, just what exactly was the mysterious SCP-5545-2? Monroe started to believe that something terrible had happened at the site, and Reed was covering it all up. But to find out for sure, he'd need to go to Antarctica and investigate it himself. Information about this supposedly safe anomaly was highly classified. Those without O5 clearance could face termination for snooping. But that didn't scare Jason Monroe. He dealt with Ketters before. He could deal with this. Or... So he thought. Monroe submitted a request and was granted unanimous approval by the O5 Council to travel to Provisional Site 344 and get to the bottom of this mystery. He took a chopper to the base soon after, armed with a concealed firearm and a hostile meme detector, or HMD, to test whether the base and its staff had somehow fallen under a hazardous mimetic effect from SCP-5545. He'd find the answers, or die trying. The moment Monroe arrived, he couldn't help but notice the strange way the staff behaved. They seemed listless, almost oppressive. When he showed his credentials to a researcher, they simply said, SCP-5545-2 is contained in Site-344-2. His request to see Dr. Reed that night was denied. Dr. Reed was busy, he was told. Wait until tomorrow. The next day, Dr. Monroe met with Dr. Reed, but the results of the meeting were underwhelming, to say the least. Just like the rest of the staff on the site, he seemed exhausted, as though he hadn't slept in days. His responses were quiet and evasive, and he refused to tell Monroe anything that wasn't in the official files already. Monroe ran the conversation through the HMD and found nothing out of the ordinary. 
What was going on here? Monroe was irritated, but not deterred. Nothing would stop him from finding out the truth. The next day, he flexed his O5 credentials and hacked into the base's security system. This gave him access to cameras around Site-344-1, but more importantly, there was a single camera inside the mysterious Site-344-2. Jackpot. But when he looked at it, the feed was an entirely black screen with the words SCP-5545-2 is contained in Site-344-2. The footage of the staff in 344-1 was equally strange. The 18 employees on site all sat at computer banks, with nothing but static playing on their screens. Monroe kept digging, though, and was able to hack into the security footage of Dr. Reed's office. As he watched, he discovered a 15-minute period where Reed left the office each day. He could use this brief window to break in and collect more intel on SCP-5545-2. Monroe was so wrapped up in the investigation that he almost forgot the more immediate danger around him and nearly wandered into one of the endless hallways of 5545-1 by mistake. He made a note to be more careful in the future. His first attempt at breaking into Dr. Reed's office didn't produce many answers. One piece of evidence was a blurry picture of what looked like a mobile task force entering a 5545-1 hallway in the dark. Another was a spreadsheet featuring all the personnel, living or dead, who worked at the site, but one name and the details of whether this person was alive or dead was completely redacted. Anything particularly juicy was hidden behind O5 clearance. If Monroe wanted the answers, he needed to break through. That night, he had a horrific reoccurring nightmare, one that had plagued him since he joined MTF ETA-10. He dreamed that he was in a fancy dining room with a grand fireplace. The room was full of statues of men and women. The men looked angry, and the women looked afraid. As he approached the fireplace, the ceiling extended infinitely up into the darkness. Suddenly, the zombie-like body of a teenage girl appears in the fireplace, hanging from a long thread. Her eyes look furious and full of rage, and Monroe somehow knows that he's the reason for her hate. When he steps into the fireplace in this dream, she attacks him. The two intertwine, and they burn forever. The one difference was that in this new iteration of the dream, he blinked upon entering the fireplace, and suddenly he was in the hallway. He awoke sure that something was terribly wrong here, but he couldn't give up now. The next day, Dr. Monroe broke into Reed's office and made a horrifying discovery. He found files indicating that Dr. Reed was knowingly sending mobile task forces and D-class personnel into the infinite hallways of 5545-1 to their doom. He also found evidence that Reed and the researchers had been spying on him, somehow intercepting copies of the notes he had been taking. That's when Dr. Reed entered the office and interrupted him. Monroe panicked and drew his weapon, holding the doctor at gunpoint. He was breaking so many Foundation rules, but right now, he feared for his life. The doctor seemed unbothered by Monroe's threats, though. He told Monroe that everything was going to plan, and that he should go back to his room. Monroe was becoming increasingly paranoid. He felt that at any moment, guards might burst in and execute him. Nothing about this place made sense. He worried he was going insane. Perhaps the only way to find answers was to go even deeper to risk it all and venture through the endless hallways to find SCP-5545-2 himself and finally discover what this thing actually was. Monroe left his room and stepped into one of the endless hallways of 5545-1 that was located just across from his dorm. He found that it was a hallway like all the others on site, plain, concrete, worn of age, with simple light fixtures on the walls. He walked for hours, recording with a concealed device. The light suddenly went out, leaving him in complete darkness. When they flicked back on, he was in a very different environment. A grand, old carpeted hallway, the kind you'd see in an old mansion. He broke into a cold sweat. What was so familiar about this place? He kept walking, racked with terror, until this new hallway finally led him to the place he'd been seeking. Site 344-2, the domain of 5545-2. It was a large, poorly lit room, filled with grimacing statues and a large fireplace at the far end. It was the exact same room from Monroe's dream, with one horrifying difference. Monroe noticed a single white thread hanging down from the infinite ceiling, and when he looked up to find its source, he screamed. 
There were hundreds of bodies hanging and swinging from the ceiling above him. Everyone who SCP-5545-2 had ever killed, including MTF members, D-Class personnel, and even the colonial explorers from hundreds of years before. And all of them were him. Every single one. They had his face, and there, hanging in the middle of the room at ground level, was the body of a teenage girl. The one from his dream. In that moment, he finally recognized her. She was the girl he killed. The first him, hundreds of years ago. Much like Monroe, you're probably wondering, what is going on here? Thanks to declassified communication between Dr. Reed and the O5 Council, we can tell you. Jason Monroe is a man who's been reincarnated hundreds of times over the last 300 years, ever since he murdered a teenage girl, a girl named Emily, his daughter. This murder sparked the existence of SCP-5545 as an eternally reoccurring punishment for his crimes. Since figuring this out, the Foundation has kept tabs on Monroe's reincarnations, whether they're MTF members, D-Class personnel, or even site directors. They see to it that these reincarnations always find their way back to 5545-2 to take his punishment and prevent the infinite hallway expansion that threatens to destroy the world. It's a plan everyone is in on, everyone except him. But every time he enters that nightmare haunting room, it all comes rushing back. In that moment though, he knew his crime and he somehow knew how many times this punishment had unfolded for him. He now had two choices. Repent and accept the punishment again, or leave and activate 5545-3, potentially allowing the endless tunnels to expand across the world. Like his many predecessors, Monroe made the decent choice. He accepted his punishment and allowed his own string to coil around him as the lights in the room went off, one by one, leaving only darkness. Jason Monroe, that version of him, at least, was never seen again. But the SCP Foundation is already eyeing up his next reincarnation and preparing to let this twisted cycle play out all over again. It skitters in the dark, its insect-like legs tapping across the marble floors as terrified Foundation researchers flee. They hear its voice, the deep, silky tones of an elderly British man spouting nonsense like, the nightmare is a dream to the nameless slug that wanders across minefield in the remains of deer and kings. While the scientists run, the creature gains on them. It's fast. Impossibly fast. While they still try to escape down this darkened hallway, ear-splitting containment breach sirens blast through the air. They may try to escape, but it's futile. In a sense, they're already dead. All they are now is prey for the heart of darkness. When someone says the word heart, there are a lot of images that come to mind. You might think of Valentine's Day, heart-shaped cards and candies. You might think of heartbreak, rejection, loss. You might simply think of a heart in the anatomical sense, the vital organ that pumps blood through our bodies. It's unlikely though that you would associate the word heart with terror, destruction, and countless deaths. However, employees of the SCP Foundation might think differently, especially if they've ever had a run-in with SCP-058. Much of the information about 058's discovery is highly classified, but the few details that are known paint a chilling picture. At an SCP Foundation test site, the day was proceeding as usual, with scientists and security personnel going about their regular daily tasks. There was no hint of danger in the air beyond the base level that always comes with setting foot in an SCP Foundation site, at least. Several researchers were performing an experiment, the specifics of which have been expunged from all records, involving the carcass of a cow. When a researcher, Dr. C, placed his hands on the specimen and prepared to dissect it, he was shocked to feel a pulse coming from the supposedly dead animal. Dr. C shared his surprise with his colleagues, but his concerns were dismissed immediately. Clearly this was a corpse. He was imagining things, they said. After all, he was relatively new to the job. It was probably just nerves. The head researcher, Dr. L, insisted that he take over. Pushing Dr. C to the side, Dr. L began to make an incision into the animal's chest. As he did, he too felt something peculiar. There was no doubt about it. This dead cow had a beating heart. He looked up from his work to tell the other researchers to explain what he felt. 
But by then, it was too late. Something horrible was already happening. With a stomach-churning sound of squishing flesh, the cow's heart burst from its chest and flopped onto the floor. It was terrifyingly large, and all the doctors jumped back from the sight of it. Four spindly, spider-like legs poked through the flesh of the heart, and it began to quickly skitter about the room. Researchers reviewing the security footage would later note that it didn't just move randomly. It seemed agitated, angry at being discovered, and it displayed immediate hostility towards the scientists in the room. Four tentacles next unfurled from within the heart and stretched out into full, writhing appendages. They moved frighteningly fast as the heart whipped around the room and were coated in sharp spines. Finally, a stinger poked out from the back of the heart, where the whole of the superior vena cava should be. All of the scientists leapt into action, with one reaching for a scalpel and another moving towards the door. But before the men could so much as call for help, the tentacles wrapped around them and ripped them to shreds. Hearing screams coming from the laboratory, security personnel arrived to contain the threat. However, they were no match for the strange creature that would soon be known as SCP-058. It tore through the security team in minutes, leaving their tattered remains in its wake. Much to the horror of the surviving personnel at the site, SCP-058 was able to escape containment and make its way to a neighboring town. Reports of the incident said that, when the creature reached the town, you could hear the screaming for miles. SCP-058 carved a path of violence through the town, attacking everything in sight with its stinger and tentacles, and leaving a trail of strange fluid from its stinger. Dozens of citizens were killed, and 70% of the buildings were completely destroyed. When agents were dispatched to the location to retrieve the creature, they were shocked to see the level of destruction caused by something so small. The scent of blood and smoke filled the air and severed limbs littered the ground alongside splintered wood and collapsed brick. The survivors removed from the wreckage were inconsolable, only calming down once they were given an amnestic to erase their memory of the encounter with SCP-058. They had to be given new lives as well, as there was nothing left of their old ones. SCP Foundation agents were only able to capture and contain SCP-058 after it was crushed by pieces of a building that collapsed on top of it. They found it flattened under a slab of stone, legs flailing uselessly, tentacles limp. The agents were able to safely remove the debris and bring in the heart without any more casualties that day. Once it was brought into captivity, the heart was contained for three weeks and remained largely quiet during that time. It was almost inconceivable that this small creature hadn't been killed in the incident, but the Foundation would soon learn that this creature was freakishly durable. It escaped once more while being transferred to an SCP containment site, again causing injuries and death. Having only experienced SCP-058 in its docile, injured form, the team responsible for the transfer was unprepared for the sheer power and violence the creature was capable of. It was able to escape an armored car and make its way into a forest, where it eviscerated several squirrels and rabbits. Or rather, they were believed to be squirrels and rabbits. The remains were too mutilated to properly identify. It was only finally apprehended after being crushed by an armored tank. But even this didn't kill the creature and it was transferred to Armed Biocontainment Area 14, where it remains to this day. There is a great deal about SCP-058 that is horrifying, but there is one attribute it has shown in captivity that would make even the most seasoned researchers' skin crawl. Though it has no anatomical capacity for speech, no throat, vocal cords, or even a respiratory system, SCP-058 speaks. Not only does it speak, but it speaks constantly, in the deep voice of an elderly British man. No one knows who the voice might belong to, or if it belongs to anyone at all. Perhaps it belongs only to SCP-058 somehow. As is often the case with SCPs that are capable of speech, there have been multiple attempts to interview the creature, and each time, it ended in complete disaster. The only interview with an available transcript, Interview 05804, was conducted by Dr. Johnston with several personnel in the room for additional security. Dr. Johnston attempted to get at the origins of the creature, asking for its name and where it was from. The creature responded in cryptic, unsettling poetry, giving answers to simple questions with, 
I had dreams of the queen, wonders that lived inside the hearts of love and silent treatments for all the elderly that I knew were once whole. After the fourth recitation of a similar verse from the heart, Personnel D-067 made a comment on the creepy nature of its responses, almost as if it was offended by the remark. SCP-058 immediately stretched a tentacle across the room, wrapped it around D-067 and lifted him into the air. He began screaming and clawing at the tentacle, in an attempt to free himself as his fellow personnel tried to help him. They grabbed at the tentacle, but found their hands pierced and bloodied by the spikes that cover it. Dr. Johnston commanded 058 to let him go, but it did not oblige. Instead, the man was crushed to death by the tentacle, and his limp body left to drop to the floor. The interview concluded with a single statement from the nightmarish heart. The sensual violence of lust is all the assurance you will ever need to know the worth of life. SCP-058 never seems to say anything that has to do with the people or events around it. It speaks in the same haunting, poetic language even when it's attacking or killing something. No matter what happens to it, what is done to it, or what anyone says, SCP-058 keeps talking, and its tone of voice with the pace of speech never changing, and further attempts to interview it have been abandoned due to the safety risk involved. So what happened to the creature often called the Heart of Darkness? Where is it now? SCP-058 is kept in an isolated containment chamber made of reinforced heat-resistant steel with a backing of reinforced concrete. In order to placate its bloodthirsty, carnivorous tendencies, the creature is given a live cow every three days. It is uncertain how exactly SCP-058 eats, given that it does not have a mouth or stomach, but every time it is finished with a cow, only bones remain. Routine maintenance is conducted on a tight schedule, and the heart is never allowed out of its containment area under any circumstances. After two previous escapes from containment, the Foundation is not taking any chances. Its constant speech is recorded via audio devices that are running at all times. Out of concern for their safety and mental health, no personnel are permitted to listen to recordings of SCP-058 speaking for more than 30 minutes at a time. It is unknown what will happen to someone who listens for longer, but it has been suggested that the consequences could be dire. If the creature ever escapes again, the containment site is ordered to be destroyed via the detonation of an on-site nuclear weapon. Under no circumstances can it be allowed to make its way out into the world again. Even with all these precautions in place, SCP-058 has been responsible for over 150 deaths at its current containment site. There are some at the Foundation who have campaigned for SCP-058 to be terminated, believing that there is more harm than good done by keeping it alive. However, all attempts to terminate it have so far failed. No matter how much physical trauma the heart suffers, it does not seem to be able to be killed. It can only be incapacitated for a short time. There is a classic horror story by Edgar Allan Poe called The Telltale Heart. In it, a man murders an old man and buries his body beneath the floorboards of his home. There, even though the old man is certainly dead, the murderer swears he can hear the beating of the heart coming up through the floorboards. No matter what he does to quiet the sound, he cannot escape it, and is eventually driven mad by the incessant beating of the dead man's heart. SCP-058 may not be a man's heart, a human heart, or even a real heart at all. However, just like the telltale heart, it continues to impossibly beat no matter how hard anyone tries to stop it. The steady thump of its pulse haunts the SCP Foundation, a grim reminder that there is something within its walls that can, and will, kill everyone it can if given the chance. It couldn't be destroyed by collapsed buildings, an armored tank, or an army of experts, and the contingency plan of a nuclear blast is not even guaranteed to work. It is entirely possible that, once the facility has been laid waste and all the staff have been incinerated, and the smoke has finally cleared, the Heart of Darkness will still be there, still beating, still talking, and still killing. It all started in 1983, with reports of human trafficking in the heart of Sin City. The FBI had gotten word of a potential trafficking ring operating out of an abandoned department store in Las Vegas, Nevada, and immediately began organizing a secret raid on the building. 
While they would indeed encounter something horrifying within that abandoned department store, it wasn't criminals or human trafficking. In fact, it wasn't human at all. This is the horrifying story of SCP-847. After weeks of planning, the raid on the department store was conducted in the dead of night. Agents covered all the exits and entrances, and a helicopter was stationed nearby in case anyone attempted to run. It should have been a perfect trap, but things never go as planned when you don't know what you're dealing with. The agents breached the door and began searching the darkened building. It didn't appear that there was any power, so the traffickers must have had great night vision and a high tolerance for creepy locales. Agents soon heard a faint humming sound coming from below, a generator. It must be located in the basement and be the hub of this criminal enterprise. Readying themselves for whatever they were about to find, the agents descended into the basement. As they moved deeper into the building, they found that lighting rigs had been set up. They must be getting closer to something, but that something was still a mystery. A senior FBI special agent was leading the charge, his pistol drawn and ready. It was quiet, too quiet. Did the traffickers already realize they were coming and clear out? He was ready to consider this bust a bust when he heard a quiet mewling in the distance, a persistent whining whimper that was undeniably human. He gave the signal to his fellow agents to follow the noise. They proceeded forward towards the pain sounds and found themselves in a wide, well-lit room filled with department store mannequins. All were broken to some degree. Some were totally smashed to pieces. Some were chained to walls and locked in cages. Others were wrapped in plastic. The agent wondered whether this was some kind of twisted joke or a messed up avant-garde art piece. That's when he noticed her, a single crouched figure in the distance, hunched over and whimpering in a darkened corner of the room near a full-length mirror. He couldn't fully make her out, but he got the sense that something was wrong. She was injured, bent over. Was she even missing an arm? Just what have these monsters done to this woman? He whispered a request for backup into his radio and pushed on. When he got within 50 meters of this strange woman, her demeanor changed entirely. She jerked around, her movements forced, erratic, and painful looking. The woman stared directly into the agent's eyes and began hobbling towards him, occasionally stopping to strike a pose as if modeling during a photo shoot. Just then, the agent made a horrifying realization. This thing moving towards them wasn't a woman at all. It was a living mannequin. As she got closer though, he realized that the mannequin's broken left forearm had been carved into a large shiv. A female junior FBI agent had been one of the many to pour into the room when the raid leader had radioed for backup. The second she entered the 50 meter range of this strange mannequin, everything changed. In an instant, its eyes and mouth began dripping with a thick, viscous resin. Its whimpering gasps suddenly became vicious, ear-splitting screeches, and it turned its gaze from the senior FBI agent. It was now focused on the junior agent, who had just entered the room and broke into a terrifying run straight towards her. The mannequin moved with a violent, single-minded purpose. Other agents began firing, but it was running freakishly fast and easily dodged most of the bullets. The few that actually hit seemed to do nothing to slow the creature down. It shrugged off the damage and kept running. With a great leap, it landed on the terrified junior agent and began jabbing her with its bladed arm. The other agents stopped firing, fearing they might accidentally hit their colleague during the panic. The mannequin was ruthless, clawing and stabbing with the strange resin leaking out of its every orifice. Terrified and unable to reach her gun, the agent remembered her training. She reached into her belt and grabbed her stun gun, jamming the two probes up against the creature's chest and giving it 30,000 volts. The creature spasmed, fell backwards, and collapsed in a heap on the ground, frozen. This was the first recorded encounter with SCP-847, a violent living mannequin with a serious problem with women. This terrifying report was passed up the chain of command until it landed on the desk of a Foundation agent working in the FBI. The Foundation quickly swooped in and claimed the mannequin, delivered necessary amnestic treatment to all who'd witnessed it, and closely observed the female junior FBI agent's recovery in a private hospital with Foundation ties. As it turns out, they were right to do so, as the junior agent was in for a gruesome fate. 
While the wound she'd suffered at the hands of SCP-847 didn't appear fatal, the fact that the mannequin's anomalous resin excretions entered the open wound changed everything. Several hours after being committed, the junior agent began complaining of limb stiffness and difficulty moving. This quickly developed into full paralysis. Over time, her skin and internal organs began to harden, until the process, dubbed plastination, came to a gruesome end. The junior agent wasn't just dead, she had been transformed into a mannequin. Foundation researchers were met with a truly horrifying realization. This means that all the other broken mannequins found with SCP-847 were likely once living humans, attacked and transformed by the anomaly, now a source for new harvested body parts. Now safely interred at a Foundation containment facility, though, the real tests on SCP-847 to determine its behavior and physical attributes could begin. The most important detail about SCP-847 is that its aggression is exclusively directed towards women, as opposed to when it encounters men, and its instincts are more self-destructive. Through a series of tests and observations, researchers have been able to pin down three different distinct patterns of behavior for SCP-847. Pattern Z behaviors occur when there are no humans standing within 50 meters of SCP-847. The mannequin will seek out a full-length mirror and pose in front of it, much like a department store mannequin attempting to show off its clothes. It remains largely inanimate during these periods and will very occasionally use a finger or whatever appendage is available, given its habit for self-mutilation, to scratch messages on nearby surfaces. Pattern Y behavior occurs when male humans with XY chromosomes enter a 50-meter radius around SCP-847. Just like its reaction to the male FBI agents who found it, 847 will initially emit vocalizations that seem like whimpering gasps, before making eye contact and striking provocative poses while approaching the subject. It will then remain static and allow the male subject to pose its body. However, after the male subject leaves the area, 847 will enter a state of considerable distress and begin removing or shattering parts of its body. The Foundation has found that the parts removed or shattered are often consistent with parts that the male subjects found displeasing during interactions, showing a masochistic desire to impress. These parts are then harvested back from plastinated victims, which brings us to the most dangerous of its behavior patterns. Pattern X behaviors occur when female humans enter a 50-meter radius around the creature. 847 will immediately become brutally aggressive, switching its noises from whimpers to violent screeches and growls. 847 experiences enhanced physical capabilities during Pattern X states. Its speed has been measured at 45 kilometers per hour, making it as fast as the legendary SCP-096. It's also been shown to exhibit extreme physical strength. It's during this pattern of behavior that it begins excreting its deadly resin, which has been proven to only be dangerous to women. In these states, the only thing capable of reliably pacifying the being is a powerful electric shock. The shock causes the creature's resin to harden, temporarily incapacitating it for roughly five minutes. Other conventional weapons and damage has no meaningful effect on SCP-847. After a number of incidents that had sad and violent endings, the Foundation Ethics Committee forbade the use of female D-Class personnel in SCP-847 testing. When it came to female subjects, 847 always slipped into a state of extreme aggression, so instead the Foundation began testing with male subjects in hopes of better understanding the dynamics between human males and SCP-847. Various misogynistic D-Class males were introduced into the containment chamber, which was modeled to look like a bedroom for the purposes of behavioral study. Each one, either during or after their interaction with SCP-847, was told to comment on some aspect they felt dissatisfied with. The mannequin shattered its own chest after hearing it described as being out of proportion. After another D-Class called its nose ugly, the mannequin broke it off. After another said that its hair was out of fashion and commented on its inability to drink, it tore out its hair and liver. All parts were replaced after the experiments. Things took their most violent and upsetting turn yet with the introduction of D-7294. A lot of the time, D-Class personnel are considered to be as anonymous as they are expendable. 
but D7294 is an exception. Before becoming D-Class, he was a successful cello teacher who brutally murdered one of his teenage students and her mother. He's typically employed in tests when the Foundation wishes to see interactions between anomalies and humans with confirmed psychopathic personalities. During his interaction with SCP-847, he belittled and humiliated the mannequin. He forced it into uncomfortable poses and even snapped off one of its fingers before being dragged from the room by Foundation guards. In the following debrief, he further berated the mannequin as useless and lousy at its job of being controlled by him. In response, 847 extracted its own brains, eyes, and clavicle before shattering its own hands in dismay. So why does 847 behave this way? While it may appear monstrous, it seems that the reason SCP-847 does what it does is all too human. It hurts women because it itself is hurting, and it's willing to hurt itself even more for the approval of the objects of its desire. As a result, it's an anomaly trapped in an endless cycle of pain and violence. Perhaps one day, it'll be able to free itself from the loop, but that day is unlikely to come for this murderous mannequin anytime soon. London is the second largest city in Europe, and underneath this bustling city is one of the oldest and largest networks of train tunnels in the world. But that's not the only huge old structure located beneath the city of London. Below even the deepest underground metro stations of this historic city, there's a whole artificial world of surveillance cyborgs, impossible architecture, and stomach-churning nutritional supplements. So be sure to mind the gap, because we're about to take you on a tour of SCP-1678, also known as Unlondon. SCP-1678 is located one kilometer below the city of London, England. From all appearances, it seems to be an exact copy of the city, though aesthetically, it's more in line with how it was around the turn of the 20th century. Gas streetlights stand on every corner, and the modern skyscrapers of the business district are recreated in the style of Victorian architecture. The epicenter of construction appears to be the Houses of Parliament, which is evidenced by the more unfinished and flawed the city becomes further out from the center one goes. Some of the buildings are made of nonsensical materials like copper pipes, and some of the gas lamps are nothing more than a ball of disembodied light floating atop a metal pole. The first big question that the Foundation had upon discovering this location was, of course, why on earth was it created? And they wouldn't have to look far, as an explanation of this bizarre mirror city plays automatically upon entering. My fellow citizen, if you are hearing this tape, then the world as we know it is finished. The sky has broken, the ground heaves with the tramp of terrible feet, and all the horror and madness from the dark corners of the world has broken free to exact its vengeance on the world of man. Evil has raised its bloody flag upon all nations of the world and crowned its unholy victory to the broken sky. Yes, this is the end. But there is a new hope. Welcome to Unlondon, a city of survivors, a city of the free. Together, fellow citizen, we will wait and prepare for the new beginning, the grand new world that is soon to come. Let the world above burn, we will endure. Let the monsters have their world, we will prepare, we will wait. And I tell you, citizen, that there will be a new morning and you will emerge from un-London and stand blinking in the sun. And on that day, citizen, there shall be a new order as we raise the Union flag over the entire world. I welcome you to un-London, the last city, and the first. From this message, it seems that this mirror city was built to be a refuge for survivors of an apocalyptic scenario. But the SCP Foundation had no knowledge of such a plan. In fact, it's still unknown who created this place, or how they did it. The one fact that was evident to the Foundation was that even though this strange place was intended to be a safe haven, it was far too poorly constructed to actually act as one. Illumination was unreliable, and most of the buildings were damp and infested with mold. It's also unclear to the Foundation where the oxygen and gas supply of Unlondon was coming from. Throughout the day, the loudspeakers around Unlondon play automated messages such as, No one is safe from the influence of mimetic beings. Bryson's home for the poor is here to help. And, 
Crime will not be tolerated in un-London. The tormentors of society will become its defenders. At the end of every hour that passes, the speakers announce the time, followed by, and all is well. When the SCP Foundation first entered on London, it was unknown whether or not any living things inhabited the city. On first investigation, it seemed from its state of disrepair that the city had been long abandoned. But soon, the Foundation met their first inhabitant of the underground city. Mobile task force members were inspecting the area around the Houses of Parliament when they discovered what looked to be a bank. As they approached the doors, they heard the following announcement over the nearby loudspeakers. Citizen, you are entering a restricted area. Have your authorization papers ready. A bobby will arrive to escort you shortly. This signaled the approach of SCP-1678-A, also known as the Bobbies. A single instance of SCP-1678-A appeared with the unmistakable sound of a police whistle, and as soon as it arrived it started attacking the members of the task force. Another announcement came over the speakers. Police! Halt! Criminal! The Bobbies are the main threat to visitors in on London, and they will attack on sight with any improvised weapon they can find. True to their name, they are all dressed in uniforms consistent with those of London City police officers from the Victorian era. What sets them apart from their historical counterparts is their construction. These beings are made out of human corpses, crudely dismembered at the joints, and reassembled using metal hinges and bolts with their heads wrapped in bandages. Bobbies are extremely hard to kill, with only high-caliber rounds and explosive weapons being effective at putting them down. Autopsies of dead bobbies have shown that underneath the police uniform, the bobbies all wear prison inmate-style jumpsuits. This adds a chilling context to the announcement about the tormentors of society becoming its defenders. It appears that the bobbies are the reanimated bodies of prisoners. In addition to the bobbies, the Foundation cataloged mm. two additional forms of artificial life present within on London. First are SCP-1678-B, or Eyes in the Sky hybrid biomechanical birds made of flesh with an exoskeleton of copper wiring. Some of these creatures are covered in a deteriorating outer layer of plastic and feathers, suggesting that they were originally meant to resemble pigeons. As their name suggests, eyes in the sky serve as a type of surveillance drone, and while they have no offensive capabilities, they still pose a significant threat to the Foundation. It's still unclear whether they're able to communicate with or summon the bobbies, but the SCP Foundation takes no chances. The last life form present in SCP-1678 is the strangest and the most frightening, SCP-1678-C, known as the Wretch. The Wretch has only ever been encountered outside the zone, which is now under SCP Foundation control, and it's uncertain how many instances of this being exist. The Wretch resembles an old woman, or sometimes old man, dressed in filthy rags. The Wretch sits at street corners holding a begging tray, and will attempt to elicit pity from anyone who happens to walk by. The Wretch will ask for food or money, but if food is supplied, it will start weeping before vanishing into a puff of black smoke. On a few occasions, audio notices playing on the city's loudspeakers have alluded to this being, saying, Do not pity the wretch. Allow them to pay the price of their betrayal for all eternity. The current Foundation protocol with regards to the wretch is to not engage with it at all. In addition to the bobbies, the eyes in the sky, and the wretches, there's another strange component to the world of Unlondon. Throughout the city, in any area designed for human habitation, the Foundation discovered multiple machines that resembled modern gas pumps. These machines are fitted with coin slots and rubber hoses that, when coins are inserted, dispense a porridge-like substance advertised as Dr. Goody's Wonder Food. According to posters around the city, Wonder Food is a meal replacement supplement, supposedly containing all of the required nutrients for survival. Wonder Food also appears to be the only food source available in Unlondon. Despite the claims by various posters around the city that Wonder Food contains all the nutrients you need and completely restores health and vitality, examination of this substance has revealed that it is, much like the rest of Unlondon, unsuitable for sustaining life. Tests have confirmed that Wonder Food is a synthetic starch gel heavily enriched with various minerals, vitamins, fats, and bulking agents, and it contains artificially engineered DNA helix structures. While it does contain all the elements required for short-term survival, 
Consuming the product for longer than six weeks will result in severe malnutrition and eventually scurvy. Further tests have shown that Wonder Food also contains psychoactive properties. The porridge contains a mixture of unknown molecular compounds which, through regular consumption, makes subjects calmer, less anxious, and less likely to resist authority. It also seems to have been engineered to cause withdrawal symptoms that set in if a person stops eating it, symptoms which include headaches and depression. Foundation personnel are forbidden to consume Wonder Food, but the substance is highly attractive to instances of SCP-1678-B and 1678-C. Like most things in a London, the quality of Wonder Food varies wildly, with some dispensers putting out a product that is so degraded that it can cause sickness, deformities, or even death in the consumer. But strangely, the Foundation has also recorded a type of unknown colorful mollusk which feeds on spillage from the Wonder Food dispensers. At present, Unlondon is only partially contained. Mobile task forces Tau-4 and Epsilon-6 have succeeded in establishing a perimeter around the Hyde Park District, where they have managed to stop any incursion from SCP-1678-A. Even though this is the only area that is fully under Foundation control, explorations have been conducted of buildings outside that perimeter. The investigations are vital for the Foundation's main purpose in Unlondon, which is figuring out who built it and exactly what kind of event this underground mirror city was meant to prepare for. The interior of the Natural History Museum yielded particularly strange insights into the purpose of Unlondon. For the most part, the museum is close to how it appears in the above ground, but with one key difference. The task force investigating the museum discovered an exhibit called The Fall of Man, exactly where the Darwin wing should have been. The exhibit, as its name suggests, details the apocalyptic scenario that would have theoretically driven people underground into Unlondon. But to everyone's surprise, its dioramas and displays didn't depict an asteroid impact, plague, or nuclear Armageddon. To the Foundation Task Force members, the scenes of destruction depicted in the exhibit were far more familiar. They recognized the reptilian form of SCP-682, the ordinary-looking brownstone basement door that serves as a gateway to SCP-2317, and, most chillingly, the imposing many-eyed figure of the Scarlet King. These were only some of the known Keter-class SCPs depicted in the museum exhibit. It was clear that even though the SCP Foundation hadn't built this city, Whoever did knew a lot about the SCP Foundation's activities. It's believed by the Foundation that whoever or whatever created on London still resides in the Houses of Parliament, and the ultimate goal of the task forces is to infiltrate the building. But in order to do that, they will first need to find where the bobbies are made and halt their production. It's believed that Bryson's home for the poor is where they originate from, but it's unclear exactly where the materials to make them come from, nor is it clear just how they're produced. Ultimately, the Foundation's goal is to catalog the entire city, and once they have stopped the production of more bobbies, MTF Tau-4 and Epsilon-6 will storm the Houses of Parliament and contain whatever force has created on London. But London is a very big city, and Unlondon is just as big, so there's no telling what else they might find exploring this bizarre location. Have you ever had a nightmare that you're running down a long, dark hallway, getting chased by something you can't see? The thing behind you isn't fast, but that doesn't matter. You can't run forever, and the thing knows it. It is a patient predator. It toys with its food. At first, you move with speed and rhythm. The metallic scraping noise behind you grows quieter. You run and stumble through the dark. Your muscles start to ache and your lungs burn. Your pace slows. It's still coming. You can hear the scraping getting louder. You start to panic. It's completely dark. You don't know where you're running or even what you're running from. All you know, as you bump against the walls and the sharp corners that rush towards you, is that you can't run forever. You trip, fall, and pain explodes through your legs as your knee shatters on the concrete ground. That scraping is getting louder. You can barely breathe. You can't run anymore with your injury. There's no way to stop what's coming. There is no escape. The scraping is right behind you. You scream, and then you wake up. Your heart is pounding like thunder in your chest, and your sheets are soaked with sweat. But you're safe. You're out of those awful dark hallways. But what if this wasn't just a nightmare? What if this scenario was real? 
and there was no escape from the horror chasing you in the darkness. That's what it's like to have a close encounter with SCP-1918, a sadistic sentient object that loves playing twisted games with its prey. But this monster never plays fair, and even worse, it's always just a simple door away. It may even be hiding behind a door near you right now, waiting to start a game with its new playmate. But soon you'll understand why some doors should never, ever be opened, and why some games are better left unplayed. SCP-1918 is an anomaly with two parts, SCP-1918 itself and SCP-1918-2 the monster's underground lair. The duo are a match made in hell, as the chambers and hallways of 1918-2 are perfectly tailored to 1918's violent hobbies. Nobody knows how long this anomaly has been operating, but it's probably behind countless disappearances. After all, 1918 has a habit of breaking its toys. The nightmare began in a small town in Maine, with a population of only 226 people but that population was about to get lower. People in the town began to report strange noises at night, a droning metal on concrete scraping noise, like someone dragging a lead pipe along the ground. At first, people just ignored the sound. It was all in their heads or maybe just a faulty oven or a washing machine on the fritz. Anything that would allow them to forget about the noise and get on with their daily lives. But the noises were coming from below. They could be heard out on the streets, most audibly near manholes and sewer grates. People started feeling unsafe in their homes. The noises were spooking animals and children. People were losing sleep. That scraping they all tried to ignore was beginning to get to them all. Letters, emails, and angry phone calls to the town council were piling up. Something had to be done before the whole town went crazy with fear. The mayor authorized four utility workers to investigate the source of the noise at a local sewage treatment facility. Considering the scraping was loudest near the sewer grates, everyone just assumed that whatever was causing all this must be connected to the sewers. Four utility workers were sent to investigate the facility, only to find that the machinery on site was working just fine. The source of the problems must have been coming directly from the underground sewer lines themselves. The four workers, equipped with headlamps, descended into a long service tunnel that fed into the sewer system. As they passed deeper into the tunnel, the darkness around them became thicker. It was a tangible presence that drowned out the light of their headlamps, similar to the anomalous phenomenon exhibited by SCP-087. When the utility workers tried to turn back, they discovered another impossibility. It seemed that the tunnel behind them had become a solid concrete wall. They were trapped, but where? It was too dark to tell. Confused and terrified, the four men stuck together, attempting to find a way out. It was too dark to see their hand in front of their face, so all they could do was navigate slowly by feeling the walls around them. These walls felt old, crusty. There was a kind of faint, metallic stench hanging in the air too, like old blood. Something horrible had happened here, and something horrible was about to happen again. All they could do was keep moving and try to stay calm. Eventually, after hours of pawing at the walls in the dark, they found an open doorway. One by one, they filed inside, only to feel blinded when bright white ceiling lights suddenly switched on. The room was all white and filled with pipes, large and small, running from wall to wall. Just then, one of the utility workers let out an ear-splitting scream and pointed towards the doorway. His colleagues turned and gasped in shock. There was something outside the door, and it was staring at them. The object filled up almost the entire doorway. It seemed like a demonic hobby horse made from a black and white candy-striped metal pole with a crude plastic head on top. The head looked like a clown's with a wide, toothy grin, but no visible eyes. It was SCP-1918. The utility workers were frozen as the object leaned forward slightly and slithered into the room, the bottom of the metal pipe scraping against the ground. It was the exact same scraping noise that had been haunting the concerned townsfolk up above. This was the thing behind it all, and as the object moved, its metal pole started to scrape words into the ground, tick, tack, toe. 
none of the four utility workers were ever seen again. It didn't take long for the SCP Foundation to descend upon this quiet main town and pick up the pieces. All relevant officials were provided amnestics, and cover stories were created for the disappearances of the four utility workers. The Foundation also commandeered the sewage treatment facility that held the entrance to SCP-1918-2 replacing all key roles at the facility with undercover Foundation personnel. SCP-1918 was given a Euclid classification due to the fixed nature of its hunting grounds. And then the real research began. The Foundation soon made some disturbing discoveries. Entrances into the SCP-1918-2 area didn't follow any kind of logic. The hunting ground of SCP-1918 can be entered from almost any location, if you're unlucky enough. There are currently nine known entrances, including five sewage grates, three utility shafts located in a sewage facility, and one toilet. And these are just the ones that the Foundation knows about. There are a huge number of ways to enter SCP-1918-2, but to this day, nothing has ever been able to leave. SCP-1918-2 is contained 20 meters below the streets of this unassuming main town. Personnel, aside from Foundation-approved D-Class guinea pigs, are refused entrance. Researchers have mapped out the layout of 1918-2 through seismic imaging of SCP-1918's movements. There are 18 identical room pairs in SCP-1918-2, or nine compound rooms. Rooms are differentiated between a one-room and a two-room by crude carvings on the floors outside of the individual rooms. SCP-1918-2 is symmetrical with half a meter wide path circling each compound room. The only deviation to this construction are the location of entrances on the sides of each individual room, which vary randomly while the location is active. What exactly does SCP-1918 do in this private little maze? It plays games, of course. Its two favorites, as indicated by the words it scrapes into the ground, are tic-tac-toe and memory. In tic-tac-toe, 1918 moves to each one room, leaving behind X markings on the floors if the room is not already marked with an O, in a manner similar to a game of tic-tac-toe. How a victim is meant to accomplish making a mark or understanding this process is unknown, as no aids are given. Blood is commonly used by victims to make their markings, hence the rusty smell in many of the rooms. In memory, the trapped victim is rendered unconscious by blunt force, presumably from SCP-1918. The subject regains consciousness in a random section of the facility. Success is marked by finding a one room identical to the central room. This event seems to possess a time limit, as the subject is pursued by SCP-1918 through the halls of the facility. The subject wins by marking the correct room with an O. What happens if you win or lose these games? It's important to note that SCP-1918 is very competitive, and doesn't play fair. If you win, the object will merely accuse you of cheating and start a new game. This will happen again and again, until eventually, you lose. And what do you do? Well, take the horrifying encounter D-Class personnel member D-2934 had with SCP-1918. Wearing video and audio equipment, D-2934 was led into SCP-1918-2 by Foundation researchers. When he eventually found his way to the central room, 1918 challenged him to a game of tic-tac-toe. And against all odds, D-2934 won the game. But 1918 didn't take kindly to that. It accused D-2934 of cheating, carving its accusations into the ground before challenging him to a deadly game of memory. After hours of chasing, D-2934 eventually lost his mind and was backed into a corner by 1918. As the object made its way towards him, he panicked, ripped a pipe from the wall, and began smashing 1918's head. As the plastic cracked under the force of the blows, Foundation scientists could see real brains inside. D-2934 screamed, and the video feed cut off. When the video turned back on some time later, 1918 stared into the camera with a different head mounted atop its metal pole, one that just a few hours earlier had belonged to the unfortunate D-2934. If there's one lesson to be learned from this terrifying anomaly, it's that there truly is no escape from SCP-1918. You're on a road trip, the kind that stretches over days on end. 
and you need to make multiple stops along the way to refuel the car and yourself. The last time you remember stopping to get more gas and a bite to eat was back in Wyoming, and now you're in the heart of Montana. Thankfully, like an oasis in the desert, you see the town of Clearwater off in the distance. It's a vibrant, welcoming little place, a perfect slice of classic small-town Americana. You took a similar trip last year, and vaguely remember stopping at Clearwater that time too, and you're glad to be back. In particular, you remember the Old Prairie Diner, a folksy little place with the most delicious huckleberry pie you ever tasted. Perhaps it's about time for you to give it another try. You fill up your tank and stop at the diner. The food tastes just as good as you remember, but one thing is off. The entire staff seems to have changed. It is the exact same diner you ate at a year ago, no doubt about that. But it looks like everyone from the wait staff to the cashier to the cooks have all been replaced. You try your best not to think about it. After all, businesses are allowed to replace their staff. But the longer you sit in the diner, the more uncomfortable the feelings become. You need to ask someone, just to push away the fears that you're not going crazy. When the waiter passes by, you compliment the food and mention you ate here last year too. You ask the unfamiliar waiter if they had worked here back then. They confirm that yes, they've always worked here, and so has everybody else. The diner is a family business. You leave town not too long after that, feeling vaguely unsettled. And as a voice on the radio warns about the incoming rain, you tell yourself that you never want to return to the town of Clearwater, Montana. As you leave, the memory of the town seems to fade from your mind in real time. But little do you know, the people of Clearwater will never be able to leave. Ever. It's because something horrifying will happen in Clearwater every single year. And that thing is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-3300. This annual anomalous event is Clearwater's own local curse, always occurring around mid-June. While many of the mechanics of this event still elude the Foundation's understanding, the outcome is well documented. Every single inhabitant of the town is replaced by a person who didn't previously exist. While some elements may carry over from their original counterparts, every person involved will simply be a whole new person, with no memories of the change or who they once were. The process known as SCP-3300 lasts between 6 and 18 days, and once the process has begun, it's impossible for any outsiders to intervene. It begins with rain, a light, dreary drizzle at first, but each day the rain gets worse. Soon it's a storm, and then a maelstrom. Flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, all centered around Clearwater but cutting off neatly just beyond it. What happens in Clearwater remains in Clearwater, and when the process has concluded and the sun shines once more, everybody has been changed. Whenever the Foundation has tried to send personnel or equipment into Clearwater during SCP-3300, one of two things has happened. In the more favorable scenarios, those attempting to enter Clearwater have simply appeared on the other side of the city limits. In the less positive instances, personnel and equipment have been lost forever within. There is no stopping or even understanding SCP-3300. According to Foundation records, Clearwater has been around at least as long as the Foundation itself, perhaps even longer. Clearwater has been able to undergo its yearly nightmare without intrusion due to a unique cognitohazardous effect, which creates a kind of mental block around memories of the town for outsiders. You won't forget Clearwater, per se, but you will find it increasingly hard to focus on like something you can only ever see out of the corner of your eye. There is no saving the people of Clearwater. The horror will play out again and again and again. The Foundation has no first-hand knowledge of what happens in Clearwater during those horrifying 18 days, but one account they have hints at a terrifying possibility. During an excursion into Clearwater, the Foundation managed to collect a diary belonging to a woman named Margaret Lane, to the best of our knowledge, Margaret Lane no longer exists. But if the contents of her diary aren't to be believed, then what goes on in Clearwater during SCP-3300 is far worse than we ever imagined. Margaret first started her diary not long before SCP-3300's 1995 iteration began. She was in the middle of a tumultuous time in her life, freshly clean from alcohol and drug addiction, forced to live with her antagonistic mother and having peculiar and distressing dreams. In the first dream Margaret recorded, she was someone else. 
a woman living in a small hut perhaps a century ago or more. It was plague time. She was looking down upon her daughter, bedridden, her skin covered in painful-looking red blotches. Her husband was already dead. That's when another man enters, a healthy man. He tells her that he's found their salvation, and then the dream ended. Margaret woke up to a gray, dreary day. There were clouds on the horizon. The rain was coming. It drizzled for the next few days before getting more intense, as one would expect from an SCP-3300 cycle. Of course, nothing seemed out of place to Margaret. Life carried on. She continued to stay clean, resisting the offers of her old dealer, though her relationship with her mother remained frosty. The rain started to get worse as voices on the radio insisted that conditions would continue to become more severe over the next few days. They tried their best to maintain normality. Margaret invited some friends, Jared, Sam, Mike, and Isabel, to come over and play D&D at her place. That was when all hell broke loose. While the group roleplayed, there was a furious banging at the door, like whoever was knocking was trying to bash the door down. When Margaret's mom opened the door to investigate the commotion, she saw that an entire family was standing there, a father, a mother, and two young children. The father immediately began furiously asking why all these strangers were in his house. When Margaret's mother tried to tell him that this wasn't his house, he became increasingly agitated and walked straight into the home. Margaret's friends attempted to subdue him, but he threw them off, displaying a supernatural strength. Margaret's mom ran in with a golf club and struck the mysterious man in the chest. There was a nasty splat, but he didn't seem to react. The golf club was just embedded in his chest, having broken the skin and sunken in. But there was no blood, just dripping water. The father then pulled the golf club out of his chest and began beating Margaret's mother to death with it, all while repeating my house again and again, while his wife and children watched with broad, sunny smiles in the rain. Somehow Margaret knew that her mother was beyond saving, and that there was no way of defeating these things in a physical confrontation. All they could do was run out to Jared's van with the rest of the group and hightail it to the police station. But when they arrived at the station, the doors were barred and it appeared empty. As the torrential rain hammered down from above, there was nothing left to do but drive out of town and try to escape whatever madness was going on here. But that was easier said than done. They drove for what seemed like hours on end as the rain and the howling wind persisted. Jared had been injured during the fight with the strange family and his health deteriorated further as the drive stretched on. They should have left the town of Clearwater a long time ago, but it seemed like they were nowhere. It wasn't long before Jared was lying dead in the back of the van, and now there were only four of them left. They kept driving, afraid, grieving, hungry, and tired, and Margaret took the opportunity to sleep. It was no time to rest, but she was so exhausted that she had no choice. Margaret had a continuation of her earlier dream. The different her, the dream her, was laying the plague-ridden body of her daughter in the river. But she wasn't the only one. All the villages of her settlement were placing the bodies of their dead in the river as the water washed around them and through them. The bodies became one with the water, and then they became the water. The water was everything. When Margaret awoke, it was to the horrifying sounds of bubbling and boiling. That's when she saw that Jared's body was dissolving. No, not dissolving, evaporating. It was bubbling and convulsing like it was made of water until the entire thing burst into a cascade of hot steam. After that, Margaret and the others left the vehicle and refused to get back inside. Nothing was making sense. It was like something out of a nightmare. As they walked, the rain hammered down upon them. They couldn't have been walking for more than a mile when they crashed into something. It was a sign, welcome to Clearwater. It was like that the town itself had drawn them back. Mike refused to return to the town of his own free will and began walking in the other direction. Moments later, he was walking back towards them in silence, though he'd never intended to. SCP-3300 had distorted his path and brought him back. It was clear that Mike was shaken to the core by the experience, but they had to press on. They would head to the grocery store for food, and then to a sporting goods store where they could hopefully grab some guns to fight the violent, altered people who'd somehow appeared with the rain. But things didn't go to plan, or what little plan there even was. Mike shot himself on the first night at Dirk's Sporting Goods, leaving only Margaret, Sam, and Isabel alive. 
Perhaps one of the most terrifying details of Mike's death was the fact he didn't even bleed. Instead, the gaping exit wound in the back of his head was just full of water. Water was all that seemed to be left of them. Sam, seemingly driven to the edge by the sight of Mike's death, grabbed a hunting knife to perform an experiment. She'd cut it into her own skin, and was horrified to see only water dripping out. They'd all been changed, and they didn't know why. That's when the survivors noticed something else. There were people standing outside in the rain, hundreds of them. Not a single one they could recognize. All new people, waiting. Sam said only one word, outside, before walking out of the hunting goods store and disappearing into the crowd in the rain, never to be seen again. Margaret mused that perhaps in the end, she had the right idea. To be taken, killed, erased, or changed would be inevitable. In the final entry in Margaret's diary, dreams blend with reality as her mind finally gives out from the terror. She realizes in her final moments that there is no way out. There is no escape. There is only water. Water is eternal. The rain is eternal. All will be changed. And given the fact that no trace of Margaret was ever found save for her diary, all her fears turned out to be right. She was taken and replaced by SCP-3300 just as will inevitably happen to all the current citizens of Clearwater the next time SCP-3300 rolls around. It will be as inevitable and as indifferent to those it affects as tomorrow's sunrise. You cannot change the rain, but believe us, in Clearwater, Montana, the rain can change you. You're driving down a long highway lost in an area you don't know too well, trying to find the right turn that'll have you heading back towards your home. You keep driving, the nighttime quiet all around you. Deciding to try and break that silence, you reach for the radio, turning the dial to filter through all the garbled, distorted voices and songs from nearby local radio stations that are too far out of range to come through clearly. You try your best to listen to the music from one radio station, but eventually the sound of the static only makes you wish for the silence you were trying to break. Your fingers nudge the tuning dial on your car radio once again, and finally, something comes through. It isn't loud or clear, but under the distortion, you can make out the sound, and it isn't a song or even a late news broadcast. The first thing you hear sounds like a short musical tone, only for about 10 seconds. Next, a young girl's voice speaking in a language you don't understand, even through the distorted audio. From her accent, you assume it's Russian, but you still have no idea what the words she's saying mean. With nothing else to listen to, you let the broadcast play. Still driving alone in the dark with nothing but the strange adolescent voice to accompany you, your mind begins to wander. She sounds like she's speaking something, but the rhythm of the words is somehow familiar to you, even though you don't speak Russian. Then it hits you. She's counting, but you don't feel smart for having worked that out. Instead, something about knowing that makes your blood run cold. You carry on driving through the night. After a few short minutes, the Russian girl stops counting, and the musical tone plays again under the distortion, leaving you alone in the car once again, with nothing but your thoughts and questions of what exactly you just heard. Thankfully, we have the answer. What you heard was SCP-3034. Since 1964, this same broadcast has been made a vast number of times, 627 times, in fact. You'd have to be within two kilometers of the broadcast's point of origin to hear it, where Foundation personnel have tried and failed numerous times to triangulate its source. The numbers heard recited in the SCP-3034 broadcast are actually a countdown from 200, read aloud in Russian. All Foundation staff are able to do while stationed at the nearby Provisional Site 3034 is scour radio frequencies for occurrences of SCP-3034. Checking their equipment is properly maintained and calibrated before they are eventually rotated off-site and replaced with a new group of staff. There is only one rule that any Foundation members working at Provisional Site 3034 must follow. They are only permitted to send one radio transmission with their equipment, a single phrase in reply to the SCP-3034 broadcast, Vizio Harashu. Receiving this, the countdown stops and the broadcast ends, but never permanently. 
SCP-3034 has been known to repeatedly occur, seemingly at random. The shortest recorded gap between broadcasts was two weeks, while the longest so far lasted six whole months. You may have heard the term number station mentioned before, but these are far from just random numerical sequences sent out over the airwaves without purpose. General speculation surrounding number stations points to them being the tools of espionage agents, a way of sending coded, highly sensitive messages or information without the risk of compromising their cover. The use of number station transmissions is often attributed to spies working on foreign soil, who utilize shortwave radio frequencies, speech synthesis, Morse code, and either regular or sporadic timing schedules. While it's true that times have changed and technology has progressed considerably, there appears to be evidence that number stations are still used among various intelligence and espionage agencies today. Despite being considered an old-fashioned method of communication, these low-tech shortwave stations remain a viable, reliable option for the transmission and reception of intelligence to field agents. The CONET project is a comprehensive archive of this phenomenon, and its founder, Aiken Fernandez, has long been fascinated by number stations. According to him, this system is completely secure because the messages can't be tracked. The recipient could be anywhere. You just send spies to the country and get them to buy a radio. They know where to tune and when. So what does the distorted broadcast of numbers from SCP-3034 mean? Is it the work of covert agents? And if so, whose side are they on? Most importantly, why does the SCP Foundation make certain there are always three of its personnel on site, ready to send the all-is-well message whenever SCP-3034 begins broadcasting? SCP-3034 was first discovered by the Foundation in 1964, after a defector from the Soviet GRUP, a division tasked with acquiring and studying anomalies on behalf of the USSR, gave them a tip. Commander Robert Malthus, along with a team of six, including a man named Agent Browning, selected for his knowledge of Russian dialects, were sent to investigate at Provisional Site 3034. Here, the team uncovered partially burned records and logbooks, all kept in Russian, along with evidence that the site had been evacuated shortly before their arrival. Carved into a desk, also in Russian, were two phrases, don't let her finish, and tell her all is well. On the team's second day at the site, an automated alarm sounded at 7.30 a.m., alerting them to the incoming SCP-3034 broadcast. Following the instructions on the desk, Agent Browning was able to stop the broadcast, telling the young Russian girl that all was well. A tape was partially recovered by the team from the site and translated from Russian. The GRUP members that had previously inhabited the station had interrogated one of their own, a man named Sergei whom they accused of stealing state property. She's not state property, he replied. She has a name. While his GRUP superior accused Sergei of planning to defect to the United States, allegedly in exchange for money and asylum, Sergei denied any collusion with America. He claimed that the GRUP at Provisional Site 3034 were meddling with powers they could not possibly hope to understand. His superior, a man named Vaslov, dismissed this claiming their work to be no different to the United States experimentation with atomic weapons at the time. One does not make deals with atom bombs, Sergei argued. One certainly does not sacrifice little girls to them. Shortly after this, a struggle broke out, with Sergei having to be restrained while urging Vaslov to cease any and all interference with it. The man spoke of terrible nightmares that he'd had, voices screaming in the darkness. That's what he wants, Vaslov. That's what it is. You cannot make a deal with this thing. We have finally contained it, and now you want to offer it. The tape's audio ends shortly after this point, with no clear answer as to what Sergei was referring to, or what offer these Russian operatives had made to it. Ever since the discovery of SCP-3034, members of the SCP Foundation have worked tirelessly to understand the purpose of these countdowns, as well as determine their origin. By September 2012, Dr. Shulkill was reaching the end of his tether with the investigation into the SCP-3034 broadcast. Mm. Over almost half a century, the Foundation had made well over 600 recordings of the Russian girls' countdowns, but still hadn't determined any noteworthy information. They were prohibited from contacting the girl via the same radio frequency, only permitted to use the phrase that stopped her countdowns. Mm -hmm. Running out of options, Shulkill contacted his colleague, Dr. Emerson, 
asking for an in-depth vocal analysis of the various recordings of SCP-3034. Even if they could narrow down where the broadcast was coming from, maybe by determining the girl's geographical location from her dialect, then that would be at least some slight progress into understanding SCP-3034. While unable to discover the girl's location, Dr. Emerson's analysis did yield some interesting findings. Emerson learned that these countdowns were not pre-recorded. The variations in the Russian girl's voice, her tone, her pitch, all seemed to indicate that every instance of the broadcast was unique. Rather than use the same recording, this girl had been counting down over and over, hundreds of times for almost 50 years. But there was more. Shulkill and Emerson then examined the distortion, the sounds interfering with the audio of the Russian girl's countdowns. What had initially seemed like garbled static seemed to actually be additional voices. And much like the girl's voice, these distorted voices were unique, different in every broadcast. However, Shulkill and Emerson were unable to accurately determine what these voices were saying. Given that the girls' countdowns were always cut short by the use of the phrase, all is well, the doctors did not have long enough samples of the audio to analyze the other distorted voices. With permission from the Foundation, the next five occurrences of the SCP-3034 broadcast were allowed to carry on for longer, giving the two doctors enough audio to determine exactly what the distorted voices were. And the results were extremely troubling. They were screams. Thousands upon thousands of children's voices endlessly screaming. Both Dr. Emerson and Dr. Shulkill agreed that it would be best to continue responding to SCP-3034 with the correct phrase, and refused to analyze the distorted screaming audio any further. Mm -hmm. Three years later, while stationed at Provisional Site 3034, a Foundation researcher named Dr. Uriel Willis decided to take matters into her own hands. She conducted an experiment that had not been sanctioned by the Foundation and attempted to make contact with the Russian girl giving the countdowns. Hearing Dr. Willis's voice, the girl stopped her countdown. After five long, painfully silent seconds, a new broadcast was heard. A piercing, high-pitched screech that caused extreme pain and dizziness to all the staff working on site. Unable to bear the disorienting sound, Dr. Willis told the girl all is well and caused the noise to stop. The following day, SCP researchers noted that there had been a significant increase in cases of missing children all around the world. A majority of these disappearances happened at the same time the screech had been broadcast and remain unsolved to this day. Dr. Willis faced disciplinary action from the SCP Foundation, and any further testing of SCP-3034 and attempts to communicate with the Russian girl were prohibited. Only one distinct change has been noted in the SCP-3034 broadcast since this incident. Almost a month later, the countdown was detected in the correct phrase given, but researchers noted that, instead of starting her countdown from 200, this time the Russian girl began counting down from 199. Nobody knows what will happen if the Russian girl's countdown is allowed to reach zero. Personnel working at Provisional Site 3034 are told to always offer her the necessary phrase before this point in the countdown. Attempting to interfere with the broadcast by contacting this girl directly not only resulted in intense pain for SCP staff, but also seems to have caused an unconfirmed number of child disappearances around the globe, as well as reducing the countdown starting number from 200 to 199. After a long night on the road, you finally find the right turn, sending you in the right direction. As you drive through the night, you keep telling yourself one thing, one small phrase over and over again. You hope the words will eventually give you comfort, but deep down you start to realize just how hollow they are. That it's just a lie we tell ourselves so we don't have to face the inevitable. But still, what choice do you have but to keep telling yourself that all is well? The year was 1857, and the Second Opium War was raging between China and the combined forces of the English and French. It was one of the many bloody colonial wars fought over resources like tea, sugar, and the intoxicating opium poppy. It was a war fought by peasants and noblemen alike. One of these aristocratic soldiers was the noble Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood, the quintessential English gentleman and explorer. While his fellow soldiers cowered behind cover, 
Lord Blackwood charged into the fray, shouldering his rifle and firing his pistol into the crowd of opposing soldiers. It was the Battle of Canton, one of the most crucial battles of the entire conflict. The French and English were laying siege to the city of Canton, also known as Guangzhou, to prove their military dominance and capture an important Chinese government official. Lord Blackwood led the charge on horseback. Every bullet seemed to find the heart of a foe. He was a true hero among men, a gentleman warrior with class, refinement, and style. And it would be thanks to his expert leadership and marksmanship on the field that the Allied European forces won the battle decisively. Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood is a name that deserves to be counted among Lord Horatio Nelson, Sir Francis Bacon, and Sir Walter Raleigh. In addition to being a skilled and honorable fighter, Lord Blackwood is a consummate explorer, naturalist, and frontiersman. During his heyday, he traveled perhaps further than any man across the known and unknown corners of the globe. He made scientific, biological, and anthropological discoveries that should have reset the course of society forever. And yet, you won't find any records in the history books of Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood, nor will you find any grand oil paintings or dedicated wings in British museums. This is because Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood is a four and a half inch telepathic neon sea slug, and he's known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-1867. While he would never admit to it, Lord Blackwood belongs to the species Nembrotha kubariana, also known as the variable neon slug. He's kept in a standard aquarium in a Foundation containment site, and is physically no different to any other member of his species. What makes Lord Blackwood unique is his powerful telepathic abilities, specifically the power to communicate by speaking directly into people's minds. And what's more, he's extremely talkative. But to what extent is anything that this anomalous sea slug says true? Or is he just like SCP-082 Ferdinand the Cannibal, a creative and pathological liar? It isn't committed to record how exactly the Foundation discovered Lord Blackwood. Perhaps a local aquarium worker worried they were going insane when they heard the voice of a 19th century English nobleman ringing in their ears whenever they were cleaning algae out of the tank. Maybe Lord Blackwood was found by SCP Foundation divers who were constantly combing the ocean for anomalous creatures and activity. What we do know is that Lord Blackwood is an incredibly strange and mysterious individual. He claims to have visited locations all around the world and encountered rare societies and creatures. The Foundation was skeptical about a number of Lord Blackwood's more outlandish claims on account of him being a sea slug, but he does appear to have the knowledge to back up his supposed experience. Interviews with Lord Blackwood have shown that he's extremely knowledgeable in the areas of geography, zoology, botany, archaeology, anthropology, and linguistics relating to his claimed regions of exploration, as well as more esoteric fields such as obscure mythology, mysticism, and cryptozoology. In other words, if Lord Blackwood hadn't gone on his escapades around the globe throughout history, how would he have come to possess this wide variety of information? The Foundation was getting frustrated and began to probe further into the personal life of the most interesting gastropod in containment. Lord Blackwood, under questioning, was always polite and amicable with Foundation staff. He seemed to display no real knowledge of the fact that he himself was a sea slug, going as far to accuse other people of being crazy or drunk when they brought the fact up to him. While none of Lord Blackwood's tall tales ever extend past the year 1910, he told fanciful stories of exploring the Americas and of his involvement in the Second Opium War on the side of the English. Naturally, the Foundation wanted proof. When they pressured Lord Blackwood on this, something even stranger happened. He gave it. The Lord told his interviewers that he would happily donate his collection to them if it gave them cause to believe what he was saying. He gave the baffled Foundation researchers the address of a cottage in England where they could find the secrets to his bizarre and mysterious past, and local agents in the area followed up on the information. Upon investigation, Foundation field agents did indeed find the cottage that Lord Blackwood had specified. It was being maintained by an extremely old woman. When questioned about her presence there, she said that she was keeping the house for Lord Blackwood and gave no more useful information. Incidentally, it appears that this singular purpose was all that this old woman was living for. She abruptly passed away from heart failure five days after the Foundation commandeered the cottage. 
Whether anything truly anomalous caused this, we still do not know. At first, the cottage seemed normal, until the field agents discovered a secret basement housing Lord Blackwood's collection. They were amazed at what they saw. The basement consisted of zoological and botanical specimens, over 3,000 artifacts, a library containing over 5,000 items, and a functioning 1800s scientific laboratory. It took about three weeks for Foundation agents working round the clock in shifts to remove all the items from Lord Blackwood's mysterious collection, and what they found raised even more questions. The collection included, but was no means limited to, 116 unknown species of plants, 107 unknown species of insects, 28 unknown species of lizards, 23 unknown species of fish, 14 unknown species of amphibians, 12 unknown species of mammals, fossils pertaining to 8 unknown species of dinosaur, fossils pertaining to 12 unknown species of prehistoric mammal, and artifacts belonging to 29 unknown indigenous societies. That's a lot of unknowns. But wait, there's more. His collection also contained a collection of seemingly unknown firearms, including three wide-bore muskets marked as Dr. B.T. Moth's effective particle destabilizers, detailed globes of Mercury, Venus, Mars, and the Galilean moons, accompanied by notes detailing possible paths of surface exploration, a heavily modified carriage containing instruments of unknown purpose, a note attached to the door reads, On the Fritz, speak with Henry, and a highly dangerous and seemingly anomalous machine that killed four Foundation field agents before it was destroyed on sight. And when questioned about this little fiasco, Lord Blackwood responded, I did warn you to be careful around my collection. That bloody thing nearly took my head off back in 97 when I found it. However, there was one thing recovered from Lord Blackwood's collection that was perhaps more interesting than all the others. 35 handwritten journals containing recordings of events described by Lord Blackwood in his grandiose tall tales to the Foundation researchers. The accounts are generally identical to the stories he had told, save for some slight variations and exaggerations on the part of Blackwood in the retelling. Most interestingly of all, all of these journals have been dated to the appropriate time period of the events described by Foundation scientists. While his stories are too numerous to all be shared here, there's one that perfectly sums them all up. Lord Blackwood's account of a possible encounter with SCP-1000, also known as Bigfoot, in Seattle during the mid-1800s. Lord Blackwood, seeking to explore the so-called New World of North America, embarked with an assistant and an indigenous American guide to the Pacific Northwest in search of the legendary Sasquatch. The trio was headed for Mount Rainier, then known as Tahoma. During the journey, Lord Blackwood found a young fox caught in a trap that had been set by a local tribe. He took sympathy on the animal and freed it, allowing it to run away to safety. That night, he and his assistant met up with the rest of his guide's tribe, and they settled down for the evening. However, things took a disastrous turn when the camp was raided by a rival tribe. Almost everyone was slaughtered in the process, and Lord Blackwood and his two companions were hauled away by the enemy tribe for a sinister purpose sacrifice to a violent local deity. As it turns out, the creature that this tribe worshipped was the very same one Lord Blackwood and the others were trying to find, a particularly large and aggressive Sasquatch. Each night, a different sacrifice was made to the Sasquatch. The victim would be placed near a forest clearing while the tribe played a primal song, and the Sasquatch would emerge from the trees to devour its prey. The first night, it ate the assistant. The next night, it ate the guide, and then it became time for the sacrifice of Lord Blackwood himself. As Blackwood was presented for sacrifice, he accepted his fate. But instead of the Sasquatch, a legion of woodland animals emerged from the trees. Foxes, elks, raccoons, and more, themselves painted with tribal symbols. The animals seemed to be on Lord Blackwood's side, and attacked the tribe's people who had been holding him captive, giving Blackwood the chance to flee into the forest during the chaos. Later, these same animals would find Blackwood again and present him with things his captors had stolen from him. An elder fox also gave him a letter, proclaiming him a knight of their people now. He was allowed safe passage back to a nearby settlement, at which point he wrote to his financiers back in England, explaining the situation and asking for more money to perform further expeditions into the Tahoma region. The whole incident had only increased his thirst for adventure and exploration. 
Whether this tale is actually true, or just a bizarre colonial fantasy from the pathological mind of a telepathic sea slug, we may never know. But it doesn't make it any less interesting. To this day, Lord Blackwood continues to be a perplexing but fascinating anomaly. He may not be the most dangerous, and he may not be the most useful either. But there's no denying that perhaps we'd all like to sit next to his tank for a couple hours one day and hear him spin a good yarn over a warm cup of tea. There's a quote that says, The beautiful thing about learning is nobody can take it away from you. But what good is learning if the knowledge might hurt you, drive you mad, or even kill you? It just sits there in your mind, like a stick of dynamite with an invisible fuse. It could blow at any moment. All it'd take is a careless slip of the tongue, and you might turn into a talking home appliance. This is a conundrum faced by anyone dealing with an info hazard, a certain kind of anomaly often dealt with by the SCP Foundation. Before we get into some of the craziest examples of info hazards and what they've done to people, because let's face it, that's what you're really here for, first we have to answer that big question everyone's a little afraid to ask. Just what is an info hazard, and how does it differ from a far more common type of SCP? the dreaded cognito hazard. Well, we're glad you're finally brave enough to ask. First, cognito hazards are anomalies that are dangerous to perceive through one of the senses. A well-known example is SCP-096, which is actually a visual cognito hazard. You see its face and your toast. It's as simple as that. And cognito hazards exist for all of the other senses too. Hearing, taste, touch, even smell. Info hazards, on the other hand, are different. These anomalous effects are triggered when you start trying to express or describe something about what you've perceived. And when you do, things start to get really weird, really fast. Maybe you're trying to explain what you just saw to family members, friends, or the police. Maybe you're a member of SCP Foundation staff trying to write up a report or a new experiment log. Or maybe you're a YouTube channel, trying to create entertaining yet informative breakdowns and explanations of anomalies from the SCP Foundation. If any or all of these apply to you, then info hazards are going to be your worst enemy. But as we look at some of the strangest examples, we'll try our best to resist their effects. First, seeing as it's so hot out, how about we take a relaxing dip in the pool while we tell you all about SCP-1128. What is SCP-1128? Well, that's a loaded question. Technically speaking, it's a massive predatory aquatic creature. But despite its huge size, the creature can hunt its prey in any body of water. Whether you're stepping in a puddle, relaxing in the bath, or, say, chilling out in the pool, SCP-1128 can track you down and potentially eat you alive. In one particularly horrifying test, a D-Class was drinking from a simple glass of water when the aquatic predator emerged yanked them inside, and ate them. Okay, so maybe you're feeling a little nervous now, but don't worry, you're still safe. Some people have even survived their attacks from SCP-1128. Well, their initial attacks anyway. The creature has a tendency to come back again and again, relentless in its ravenous hunger for human flesh. Whenever it attacks successfully, all that's left is some blood floating on the water. But again, please don't worry too much about this creature. We don't have another 682 on our hands. After all, it's an info hazard. It can only start hunting you if you receive a written or verbal description of the creature. Oh, or some kind of visual representation of the creature too. Actually, on second thought, you might want to get out of the pool. Now. And put down that drink too. Instead, let us tell you a nice little story. You step into a bar, smelling of fine liquor and rich mahogany. You even get a whiff of some fine leather-bound book. You see us sitting at the bar, motioning for you to come over, and you decide to approach. You're intrigued by our winning smile and our vast knowledge of anomalies and SCP Foundation lore. You take a seat next to us and order a drink. Get something fancy. It's on our tab, after all. Our treat. What does this have to do with info hazards, you ask? <laughs> That's the thing about SCP-1893, kid, we say, our dulcet tones smoother than scotch. You can never just talk about it. It's an info hazard that forces information about it to be delivered like a story. That's why we're in this bar right now. That's the setup. 
It expresses actual information about itself through the dialogue, see? You nod, beginning to grasp the concept as the bartender serves you your drink. It's been forever since you've been to a bar. Feels good to be out again, honestly. You drink deeply, savoring the flavor, but you almost choke when you see the man standing in the corner. He's so large and so distinctive, it surprises you that you hadn't noticed him before now. He stands in the corner, a freakishly tall and muscular guy, like a basketball player who decided to become a pro bodybuilder. His muscular arms are bulging out of his white vest, and a pair of bull's horns are tattooed across the top of his bald head, making him look like the devil made flesh. He stares at you with a subdued kind of annoyance, as if to say that you're not in real danger quite yet. But if he wanted, he could grab you and twist your head off like a bottle cap. What's with the huge guy, you ask us, more than a little concern in your voice? Oh, <laughs> him? We reply with a smirk. He comes with the anomaly. He appears in every SCP-1893 experience to an extent, though his level of involvement varies. If SCP-1893 doesn't perceive you as an annoyance or a threat, then you're good to go. But if 1893 starts to feel like you're gonna cause it some problems, then the guy with the horn tattoos is gonna intervene. Speaking of which, you look up and you see that the giant man is now standing next to you, brow furrowed in visible rage. He picks up your drink and crushes the glass in his hand without flinching, dripping booze and blood onto the counter. He snarls, I think you've had enough, buddy. Now it's time for you to leave, or we're gonna have to get physical. Gabish. You don't need to be told twice. You grab your hat, get up and leave the bar, abandoning us on our lonely stool. But our next info hazard still awaits. You like poetry? Japanese poetry, yes? The Humble Haiku. It's Dear 931, a unique info hazard. It's so poetic. Though specifically it takes the form of haiku. So what does that mean? A rigid structure. The first line, five syllables, then seven, then five. We can't talk about this in ways other than haiku. It is challenging. Object class is safe. It is kept at site 19. Need third tier clearance. So what is this thing? SCP-931. It is a rice bowl, white with a blue band and a cracked blue pattern all inside the bowl. And we must confess, we took that one from the file. Man, haikus are hard. Three inches in height, 4.5 inches across. Metric doesn't fit. No maker's marks found. Suspected to have been made late 1900s. Really makes you think on the skill of these poets. Sans anomalies. Sure, it can't kill you, but writing these drives you mad. Curse 931. Trapped in this rhythm scheme makes the old man's torture world look like a resort. Okay, let's move on. Other SCPs to see. We're sick of haiku. Okay, back to normal. Time to shake off the structures of SCP-931 and talk about another iconic info hazard, SCP-3007. This incurable info hazard is a lot less whimsical than a rice bowl that forces you to write and speak in haiku. In fact, it's literally killed seven people, and some in surprisingly gruesome ways. The main component of the info hazard is known as SCP-3007-1. This is an extremely vivid anomalous hallucination that affects those under the 3007 umbrella, known as SCP-3007-2. To be afflicted with SCP-3007 is a truly horrifying and debilitating condition. The hallucinations occur at an average of four times a day, with each episode lasting for as long as an hour. And during these episodes, the victims are at risk of grievous bodily harm, or even death. So the question now is, what exactly is the SCP-3007-1 hallucination? To the people experiencing it, they appear to be transported to a strange alien world consisting of a huge number of white towers or pillars stretching into the sky. SCP-3007-2 specimens are trapped on a series of bridges, incredibly far off the ground, that connect these various structures. This anomalous area is known as SCP-3007-3. It is important to remember that people transported to this world still remain, physically, in our own. However, any damage sustained with SCP-3007-3 will carry over into our own reality. 
To give one particularly gruesome example, some people fall from the precarious bridges and tumble to their deaths in SCP-3007-3. Back in our reality, they suddenly explode from the damage of an invisible high-speed impact, killing them instantly. There's much more to SCP-3007, enough that it probably warrants its own explanation, and the SCP Foundation takes it extremely seriously, believing that if the info hazard is allowed to breach containment and become contagious, it could result in an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. As a result, anyone found to be infected by SCP-3007 is contained and summarily terminated to reduce the risk of its spreading. To make things even worse, there are also concerns about SCP-3007-3 seeping into our reality, as those standing within a 2-meter range of SCP-3007-2 during a 3007-1 episode can actually hear the sounds from the terrifying hallucinatory reality. Okay, that was a little scary. How about instead of falling to your death without falling at all, we talk about a nice movie. Gonershav by Martin Scorsese, one of the best gangster movies of all time. Wait, you've never heard of Ganeshrav? It's got everything. Action, suspense, romance, a mountain of black thorns on which lives a dark tyrant of terrible and unknowable power. You sure you've never seen Ganeshrav? Well, here's the thing. All signs point to movies like Ganeshrav's and many others simply not existing. This comes as a result of SCP-2747, an info-hazardous phenomenon that causes people to talk about works of fiction that don't exist. These works often feature commonalities, like an ethereal or disturbing tone, ambiguity, black thorns, and a sinister, mysterious antagonist. The Foundation is doing all they can to hunt down and suppress SCP-2747, but it's proving more difficult than they'd imagined. Currently, the leading hypothesis is that these tales may have actually existed once, but were erased from reality, leaving only the residue of memory and the odd scrap of evidence around. Many researchers speculate that the various pieces that form SCP-2747 are anaphabola, pieces of fiction accidentally composed with the perfect elements to cause them to quite literally erase themselves over time. Now, the greatest concern that the Foundation has about these anaphabolas is that they might actually be one, and their reality is on the precipice of collapse. But we really don't have time to unpack that right now. And like SCP-3007, a full explanation of this anomaly would take some time and is probably best tackled on its own. But there you have it, folks. Info hazards. They all say that knowing is half the battle. But in this case, it is the whole battle. And if you know, you lose. Not really a battle at all, come to think of it. More of a trap. But whether it's a vicious megafish, a strangely buff man with bull tattoos, a poetic rice bowl, or a nightmarish ordeal of daily hallucinations, there is no doubt that info hazards are some of the most strange and fascinating anomalies that the Foundation has to offer. Oh, and of course, how could we forget the most well-known info hazard of all, SCP-2521. This entity is so info hazardous that its foundation file entry is written in pictograms. This is because whenever information is recorded about this entity, it manifests and steals it. If you write it down, it'll take the paper. If you make a note of it on a computer, it'll take the computer. And of course, if you talk about it, it'll... Oh no, 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 I can't, no, 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 no! Ah! <sighs> oh, that was a close one. But I'm okay. For now, at least. Agent Carla Mendoza was one of the best field agents that Site 41 had ever seen. She was professional, cool under pressure, and when the situation demanded it, she could be a straight up badass. During a Chaos Insurgency raid on the site, she'd single-handedly killed four different insurgents, the last one with her bare hands. During containment breaches, she'd always be the first one charging into the fray, her Foundation standard issue Beretta drawn and ready to fire. Agent Mendoza was so devoted to the job that she took up the site director's offer to start living on site, so she could always be there to help if an emergency situation unfolded. After all, when it all hits the fan, you want someone as utterly unshakable as Agent Mendoza on your side. The job had thrown the worst of the worst at her and she'd never even flinched. So surely nothing could scare Agent Mendoza, right? 
After a long day of kicking ass, taking names, and filling in the properly mandated amount of SCP Foundation debriefing paperwork, Agent Mendoza retired to her Site-41 quarters. She felt exhausted and sweaty, so before heading to bed to watch some wonderful SCP Explained videos on her phone – how kind – she decided to take a quick shower. The last thing she expected was for this particular shower to become… well, let's say… Hitchcockian. The water was running hot and clean, filling the air with steam. Agent Mendoza was lathering up her hair when she first heard the noise, heavy, wheezing breaths coming from just behind the shower curtain. The second she heard it, Agent Mendoza felt a kind of brutal, crushing anxiety that she'd never experienced before, like a hand was reaching into her chest and squeezing her heart. The self-defense training that had been encoded into her muscle memory over years of working at the Foundation kicked into effect. In a blind panic, she struck out at the shower curtain, causing it to sway outwards and land directly on the face of Mendoza's wheezing voyeur. Who or whatever it was, it was standing right there, less than a meter away from the shower. The wheezing carved into Mendoza's ears like a butcher's knife. What an awful, monstrous sound. And despite the fact that the shower curtain obscured its face, she could still somehow see it. The way a defenseless animal can sense an approaching predator without ever locking eyes on it, and just somehow know that it's too late for them to escape now. Every training session, every achievement, every piece of battle-hardening experience, it all evaporated in the presence of that… thing. Mendoza was so terrified she might as well have been a child. The monster just stood there beyond the curtain, its raw, fleshy face parted into a freakishly wide, yellow-toothed grin. She didn't know how, but on some deep, primal level, she was aware that if this thing got its hands on her, something horrific beyond description would happen to her. She was too terrified to even move a muscle in its presence. She remained like that standing in the shower and sobbing quietly for the next three solid hours, until the creature finally disappeared. When her colleagues found her, she'd experienced moderate scalding wounds from the hot water of the shower. It took several hours for Agent Mendoza to compose herself enough to share her story. A couple days later, Tim Ellis, a junior-level filing clerk, was found trapped in a Site-41 supply closet. He'd urinated in his Foundation-issued slacks and was in a state of borderline catatonia. When his superiors asked him why he'd been spending two hours in a supply closet on company time, he reported that it was because a monster had appeared outside the door when he was searching for a replacement stapler. Despite never actually opening the door to see what was outside or call for help, Mr. Ellis said that he felt as though he would have had a heart attack if he actually opened that accursed door. He was able to provide a clear description of the monster. He said it was tall and emaciated, with reddish-brown skin that made it seem almost burnt or rotten. While it stood there and waited beyond the supply closet door, it let out the most awful wheezing noise, like an old, rusty iron lung. But the image that Ellis seemed most fixated on was the monster's face or lack thereof. Just a huge, grinning mouth that covered up its entire head, stocked with an arsenal of massive yellow teeth. Ellis was visibly shivering as he talked about it. Two incidents are an unpleasant coincidence, but three are a bona fide pattern, and it didn't take long for more sightings of this strange new anomaly, dubbed SCP-303 or the Doorman, to pop up across the site. It earned that name by always appearing behind some kind of doorway, or at least a movable divider, in the case of Agent Mendoza's shower curtain. Whenever it appeared outside a doorway, nearby Foundation personnel would report being struck with a sudden paralyzing terror that made engaging with the creature impossible. Attempts to call for help were also often stifled, as the very presence of the doorman causes disruptions to electrical equipment. Whenever the doorman manifests in your proximity, it's safe to say that it'll be commanding your absolute, undivided attention. This was a particularly frightening case for the SCP Foundation, because it was one of the few anomalies bringing the fight directly to them. Most sentient anomalous beings would do anything to avoid getting captured by the SCP Foundation and contained in one of their high-security sites, full of experienced researchers and state-of-the-art equipment designed specifically to neutralize their effects. The doorman, however, just seemed to take this as a challenge, 
turning even the most hardcore personnel on the site into gibbering wrecks with its mere presence. But the doorman was just getting started. Agent Henderson had a frightening encounter in the break room. He was pulling a long shift and just wanted to grab some coffee creamer from the cabinet. However, as he approached the cabinet, he heard the telltale wheezing and that terrible, overwhelming terror set in once more. The doorman was sitting inside the cabinet in a fetal position. He just knew it. Could this thing really appear just anywhere as it pleased and keep people in or out until it decided to dematerialize and torment somebody else? When the creature finally dematerialized and the cabinet was examined, the coffee creamer was found to be missing, leaving Agent Henderson distraught. This was the first recorded instance of the doorman stealing a physical item, but it would be far from the last. Henderson wondered whether the creature that had just humiliated him was sitting somewhere else now, sipping from a warm cup of joe with its big freakish mouth and laughing at him. But a few incidents after this, things would become considerably more serious. The doorman was about to take its first life. Well, it isn't really that simple, if you want to get into the semantics of the thing. When the body of Dr. Barker was found inside the second floor storage room after a spree of SCP-303 incidents, the question was naturally posed as to whether the doorman had gotten more dangerous and finally directly attacked one of its victims. Not quite. There had only been one way in and out of the storage room, a secured decompression chamber, and the doorman had appeared inside this chamber while Dr. Barker was in the storage room, effectively trapping him inside with the sheer terror it causes in its victims. He was trapped in the room for a grand total of five days, at which point he finally died of dehydration, and the doorman demanifested shortly afterward. The staff of Site-41 scaled up their countermeasure efforts, hoping to discover more about and perhaps even trap and contain the infamous doorman. Dr. Burroughs, Researcher Matthews, four members of security personnel, and four D-Class operatives formed a kind of strike team, ready for quick dispatches whenever the doorman happened to manifest. It wasn't long before the creature appeared in a room on the first floor, but the team quickly intercepted its location, ready and eager to gather more data on the mysterious being that had been terrorizing them all for weeks. Dr. Burroughs ordered one of the D-Classes to open the door and look inside, but the D-Class refused out of fear. The doctor told him that if he didn't open the door, he'd be transferred to SCP-682 duty. The D-Class frantically shook his head and said, I'd rather take my chances with the reptile than go in there. The doctor was getting frustrated. He told the D-Class that if he didn't open the door immediately, he'd be terminated right there on the spot. The D-Class still refused, saying that he'd take death over what the doorman would do to him if he stepped inside. Without hesitation, Dr. Burroughs ordered one of the security officers to shoot the D-Class then and there. The shot was fired. The D-Class was terminated. Dr. Burroughs then ordered a female D-Class who just witnessed this callous execution to open the door, or the same abrupt death would befall her. She still refused, then began to describe the awful things she believed the doorman would do to her if she went inside. Researcher Matthews was visibly shaken by the description. Dr. Burroughs decided not to terminate this D-Class immediately. He instead wanted to see just how much pressure the doorman's anomalous fear-based resistance mechanisms could take. Another D-Class was given a combat knife, and also given the order to cut the female D-Class with it every time she refused an order to go inside. After two hours of repeated asking from Dr. Burroughs, the female D-Class dropped dead from blood loss. At no point did she ever attempt to open the door. It seemed that in all the cases for those in the thrall of the doorman's anomalous effects, death is a truly preferable alternative to ever facing it head on. It's worth mentioning that these tests were conducted back in the 1970s, before the formation of the Foundation's Ethics Committee, which explains why their methods feel a little needlessly cruel. Since then, the doorman has fully commandeered the second floor storage room, the same one where it caused Dr. Barker's death. It only leaves the room to steal more items from around the site. These items have included a cryotube, three sets of standard Foundation surgical equipment, two D-Class research cadavers, one gasoline-powered generator, a variety of chemicals from the chemical storage areas, and, of course, poor Agent Henderson's can of powdered coffee creamer. The reason for the doorman taking an interest in these particular items remains unknown, but we can only assume that nothing good can come of it. 
And there you have it, folks. The strange, frightening, and eerily inconclusive tale of the doorman. All we can really say is that we're awfully glad he's fixated on bothering Site-41, because who knows what would happen if he widened his net to the rest of us. Thankfully, we won't need to think about that. Oh, that's odd. Can you hear that? I thought I was imagining it. Though come to think of it, I can't help but feel a little uneasy right now. Do you ever get that feeling that you're being watched? Wait, the door. There's something behind the door. Can you feel it? Can you feel its red flesh and rotten teeth pressing up against it? Breathing. Waiting. Can you feel it staring at you without eyes? Looking deep into your very soul. <laughs> well, that's good. But just stay cautious, okay? After all, life has many doors, Ed Boy. And you never know who or what will be waiting for you behind the next one. Growing up in a small Virginia town near the mountains right on the border of West Virginia, Zane heard all kinds of stories from his grandmother. Tales of mountain lions who could transform into ghostly women. The Tailypo, a fluffy rodent-like creature on an endless quest to get its tail back from the hunter who took it. The Mothman that appeared with glowing red eyes to warn of impending tragedy. Most of all, she warned him about the deer. Sometimes, she used to say, when you're out in the woods late at night, you'll see a deer acting a little bit funny. Maybe it's making strange sounds. Maybe it's standing up like a man. Maybe it's staring at you from the shadows and won't look away. If you ever see one of these deer, promise me you'll get away from it as fast as possible. Don't look at it. Don't talk to it. Just get far, far away. He promised her every time. But as he got older, he started to forget his grandma's stories, letting them fade away with memories of the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. He didn't think about the stories again until he was older, a junior in college and embarking on a camping trip with his roommate Josh. They were both staying with Zane's family for the summer and had been enjoying the sunshine and fresh air. They'd gone hiking, picked blackberries, and gone fishing to their heart's content. After a while, they got sick of sleeping in the cramped house and decided to have a proper camping trip out in the mountains. Campsites were crowded this time of year, but Zane knew a spot just isolated enough that they could kick back, enjoy nature, and relax in peace. They packed their supplies and headed out into the forest for a weekend they would never forget. By nightfall, Zane and Josh had pitched their tents, built a fire, and were starting to make some dinner. They roasted hot dogs and heated cans of beans over the fire and decided to start telling some classic scary stories. Sitting by the crackling fire, listening to the rustling leaves, snapping twigs, and the chittering of animals all around, Zane couldn't help but remember the stories he had almost forgotten. All of the strange, inexplicable things that came out after the sun went down and the forest went quiet. He thought he could hear the footsteps of something walking by their campsite, circling them. But it was probably just his imagination. As Josh told stories about babysitters stalked by killers and drivers picking up ghostly hitchhikers, Zane was thinking about the deer. He shuddered but shook it off, and after some more stories and a few too many s'mores, the two friends decided to get some sleep. After several hours, Zane woke to the sound of Josh unzipping his tent. He sat up, ready to yell at his friend for waking him up, but the sight of Josh's pale, frightened face stopped him. There's something here, was all Josh could say. His hands, Zane noticed, were shaking. Hey man, it's, it's okay, let's check it out. Zane patted Josh on the shoulder. He was pretty sure his friend just wasn't used to camping in actual nature, but reached for his hunting knife just in case. He grabbed a flashlight and switched it on, following Josh out into the darkness. He swept the beam across the clearing, and it illuminated a pair of orange eyes staring directly at him from behind a nearby tree. What the? He approached the shape, trying to get a clear look at it. As it became more illuminated, his stomach dropped. It was a deer, but something was wrong with it. Its mouth was wide open, its jaw working up and down like it was trying to make a sound, but nothing came out. But that wasn't the worst part. As the flashlight beam illuminated the animal's body, Zane realized that somehow, its head was on backwards. What the? Josh appeared behind him gasping. Shh! Zane shushed him intensely. He suddenly remembered his grandmother's warnings. You know what? I don't feel so great. I think we should go back to the car and head to my place. He gave Josh a look, shaking his head as if to say, don't say another word. By the glow of their flashlights, the two packed up their campsite, all under the gaze of the misshapen deer. They drove home in silence, Josh only speaking once to ask, 
What was that thing? Zane shook his head. I don't know, but it wasn't a deer. They crept back into the house and went to bed. They knew they would never speak of tonight ever again. As Zane began to drift off to sleep, his last conscious thought was to glance out the window. There in the yard, not five feet away, was a deer watching. He didn't know it, but that night Zane encountered an instance of SCP-6448. SCP-6448 is an anomalous species of creatures that appear to belong to the Cervidae family, nicknamed the Not Deer. They are highly intelligent and can be distinguished from ordinary deer by unusual behavior and physical deformities. Some of these have included legs that bend backwards, the eyes of an animal other than deer, forward-facing eyes, jerky movements, lack of fear towards humans, and walking on two hind legs. Most notably and most frightening, SCP-6448 instances will watch and stalk humans for a duration of hours or even days. They will follow humans home and steal items from their domains including weapons, food, and other personal items. They are most frequently found in the deep woods at night when a person is completely alone. If someone encounters an instance of SCP-6448, if they acknowledge any of the creature's anomalous traits, it will attack. In order to limit the loss of life and ensure that the SCP Foundation employees exercise the utmost caution when dealing with SCP-6448, the Cryptozoology Division issued the following guidelines. If you notice a deer that seems off, look away and ignore it. If it knows that you've noticed it, it's too late. If you hear your name, whistling, or something else in the woods calling for you, don't acknowledge it. Never acknowledge it exists. Don't respond. Don't go looking for it. Don't call back to it. If you're walking at night and you feel something breathing on your neck or whispering behind you, the key to your safety is pretending that everything is normal. Your survival is dependent on your ignorance. Whatever SCP-6448 is, they appear to be intelligent enough to understand when they are being studied, and they don't seem to like it very much. On January 11, 1994, a group of three SCP-6448 instances broke into Site-41 in North Carolina, using a tunnel they had carved over a long period of time. At the time, there was an instance in containment, but in all of the chaos of the breach, the specimen was lost. Every time an instance was captured and contained near SCP-6448's habitat, it would later escape via similar tunnels. SCP-6448 was officially classified by the SCP Foundation in 1980, but those from the Appalachian region have known about these strange creatures since at least 1947. From folktales and campfire stories to secondhand and even firsthand encounters, the locals are aware of the Not Deer's existence and are largely familiar with the precautions necessary to avoid them. Though many of the civilians that encounter SCP-6448 avoid notifying the authorities, there have been several recorded 911 calls involving the Not Deer since 2000. The following is a log of those calls. February 1st, 2000. Victim, age 41 female, dialed emergency services after hearing their name being called from the woods near their home. The victim recounts the vocalization being likened to a scream in a voice that they do not recognize and requested assistance in locating the source. Emergency personnel requested the subject place their phone on the floor outside the home to listen for the alleged sounds. After two minutes, a vocalization was heard that was calling to the subject by name, emanating from the nearby forest. The subject was instructed to investigate the disturbance themselves and keep services updated on the situation. The victim then began to walk into the woodland, getting about 50 meters into the underbrush before inexplicably stopping. They claim there to be a noticeably large deer standing in the way of the path. She begins to walk closer, though states it does not move. Subject diverts from the path and begins walking in a different direction. After 30 minutes, no source of the voice is determined. The caller returns to their residence. June 13, 2002. Victim, age 28, male, calls 911 regarding a home break-in. The caller notes numerous items to be missing from their residence and requests an investigation. Operators dispatch two investigators to visit the home and, and pertain a potential perpetrator. The pair note that based on earlier CCTV images, 
all cutlery, sharp objects, firearms, light bulbs, and a single copy of the novel The Day After Roswell are missing. Also noted is that there is a complete lack of any fingerprints at the scene, with no doors or windows having been broken into. Analysis of the home's CCTV footage revealed there to be a two-hour period of missing film, with the exception of a single frame containing a service nippon on its hind legs reaching towards the camera. Its frontal hooves have been warped to resemble fingers. No footage of the entity exiting the home was discovered. November 19, 2005 a cattle farmer, age 54 male, reported to local authorities the sudden disappearance of over 30% of his largest herd. Response team searched the nearby area for four hours, though found no trace of his cattle. The victim was recommended to set up trail cameras and note any unusual activity overnight. At 1.11 a.m., two SCP-6448 are seen walking through the field before fleeing. One places an object into the ground, later discovered to be a single fork. A week after this discovery, 200 discarded bovine hooves appear at the location. March 4, 2009 Victim, age unknown, gender unknown, dials 911 to request assistance from animal services. The victim is standing within a forest in front of a service elephus, which is violently contorting. The victim attempts to state, you better get a vet or something, I don't think it's well, before a piercing screech is heard and the line falls silent. Recovered footage depicts the aforementioned animal squirming, seemingly in pain. A vicious churning is audible as a black mass erupts out of the instance, and the video turns to static. October 11, 2012 Victim, age 23 male, is a junior wildlife officer at the Cherokee National Forest, Tennessee. They radio their supervisor in the early morning regarding a herd of Odicolius virginius within the reserve. Supposedly, there is a single animal that, upon first glance, appears average, though possesses divergent attributes, including backwards joints, enlarged abdomen, and forward-facing eyes. Upon stating this, a distant whistle is audible, and the victim stumbles slightly. They begin to say, What the? Did it just whistle at me? Before the sound of hooves rapidly getting closer is heard. Notably, the hoofsteps did not sound to be in the traditional gallop of a cervid. October 12, 2012 The former victim's supervisor calls authorities following the victim's absence from the reserve night shift. Following this, their radio begins to crackle. The victim's voice can be heard on the other end, and he requests the supervisor's attention. He calls regarding a herd of Odicolius virginius within the reserve. They claim there is a single animal that upon first glance appears average though possesses divergent attributes including backwards joints, enlarged abdomen, and forward-facing eyes. Suspecting the creature to be a rare genetic malformation, the victim requests their supervisor to come to the location. The supervisor questions the victim about what happened the night previous. There is no reply. Upon the supervisor's and law enforcement's arrival at the site, a herd of approximately 80 Odicolius virginius was present. A single entity is in the field's center and appears to be standing separate from the rest of the group. It flees the scene upon realizing the law enforcement's presence. Where it formerly stood lay a standard two-way radio. April 8, 2016 Victim, age 35, female, dials 911 using a satellite phone distressed. They state they are in Redacted. County Woods and are being followed. She claims that despite seeing no one for the duration of her hike, she, quote, feels as if she's being watched, and has heard someone walking behind her at various points in the trip. The victim is unable to give an adequate description of their location, but knows the route to return to her residence. Operators request the victim to return to a point wherein she can provide a sufficient geographic description of her position. The victim remains on the line for the duration of the hike back to a readily used portion of the wilderness trail. Along the journey, various unnatural sounds can be heard. These include footsteps, rock slides, coughing, whispering, and whistling. Nearing the main trail, all woodland noises such as birds and wind cease suddenly, and the victim states she can see a malformed deer carcass coated in a thick layer of black slime. At this time, human screams can be heard in the distance. Operators request the victim continue and ignore the other stimuli. Agents embedded in local law enforcement, suspecting SCP-6448 involved, notify Gamma-4 to the situation. Twenty minutes later, the victim returns to the main trail. Gamma-4, now operating the 911 call, informs the victim not to respond to any further unusual activity and briefly outlines service protocol. For the duration of the victim's journey to her home, 
two sets of breathing are audible. The victim successfully returns to her residence and shuts the door behind her. Now out of sight from SCP-6448, agents inquire of the victim's address, and the victim promptly complies. Operatives instruct the victim to have possession of all firearms and weapons on the premises and to barricade herself inside a safe space with one exit point. The victim swiftly begins grabbing all available weapons and throwing them inside a wardrobe. It is at this time there is a knock on the front door. The victim does not respond and continues to hoard sharp objects from kitchen drawers. The knocking becomes more violent as the handle is jostled and is shaken incessantly. A voice on the other side repeats the phrase, Hello, it is me. Hello, let me in. In a calm manner as the door begins to shake. The victim retreats to her wardrobe, armed with a small firearm. Upon sealing herself in the space, the knocking ceases, and footsteps can be heard becoming further away. The sound of galloping is audible as the front door caves in. Hoofsteps can now be heard inside the home. The entity continues to repeat, Hello, it is me. Hello, let me in, as it searches the small building. A bright light flashes overhead, seemingly circling the house. Eventually, the entity enters the victim's bedroom. Through a small slit in the wardrobe door, the victim can see a Cervus canadensis standing on its hind legs and surveying the room. Its movements are crooked and stiff, seeming to struggle to stand in a bipedal fashion. It slouches down to a quadrupedal crouch, similar to the stance of an arachnid. It inhales heavily, and its head locks on the view of the wardrobe. It is noted as possessing human eyes, it scampers towards the subject and opens the door. A single gunshot is heard. Responders found no trace of either SCP-6448 or the victim. Containment of SCP-6448 is focused on the investigation of any deer exhibiting anomalous traits in and around the Appalachian area. Any civilian sightings of SCP-6448 are to be handled by Mobile Task Force Gamma-4 or the Green Stags. Any possible deaths resulting from SCP-6448 will be blamed on hiking accidents, and any reported sightings can be explained away with chronic wasting disease. CWD, occasionally referred to as zombie deer disease, is a prion disease affecting members of the Cervidae family. Symptoms of the illness include loss of motor function control and damage to decision-making, as well as gradual degradation of all mental faculties. It is 100% fatal. However, though the disease does exist, most recorded cases of it in the Appalachian region can actually be attributed to instances of SCP-6448. Any captured instances of SCP-6448 should be transported to Site-44 for the Cryptozoology Division's containment and study. On November 29, 2019, they finally got their chance to bring a not-deer into custody. The Green Stags were able to capture an instance of SCP-6448 with the help from MTF New 7 Hammerdown and their Heavy Vehicles Division, as well as some experimental shock rifles. One not deer was knocked unconscious in the conflict, and its body was loaded onto an armored helicopter and flown straight to Site-44 in Essex, England. At the site, it was then placed in a reinforced steel containment cell and heavily sedated. This entire process went off without a hitch. As the entity began to regain consciousness, cryptozoology specialist F. Oz watched it through a one-way glass window and attempted to speak to it through the intercom. Greetings, SCP-6448, researcher Oz began. At the sound of his voice, the creature jumped to its feet, staring at the intercom. Can you understand me? We've seen your genus speak English just fine in the past. The animal did not answer, but began licking one of its legs and behaving as if it were an ordinary deer. Researcher Oz sighed impatiently. Please, we know your secret. The not deer stopped what it was doing, freezing completely still as it listened to the words. Admittedly, it wasn't exactly well kept. If you just look at yourself for more than a few seconds, it is very clear that you're not normal. At this, the creature, which had been facing away from the window, swiveled its neck 180 degrees, breaking its own spine with an audible crack. It stared unblinking at the window and directly at Researcher Oz. Oz turned to the containment staff, suddenly anxious. I thought you said this was one way. The staff assured him that it was, and there was no way the not deer could see him. Still, its eyes were locked directly on his face. He shook off the sense of unease and continued his line of questioning. Are you something imitating deer? It is clear that if so, you possess basic anatomical knowledge of them. 
though details are clearly faulty. In fact, a better question would be, how? If in fact you are not what you pretend to be. The Nakdir opened its mouth at this, revealing unusually sharp teeth. It moved its jaw as if attempting to speak, but only a choking sound came out. <clears throat> Sh shall we move on? Oz asked. What I'm more concerned with here is why you take our people. Is it a vendetta? Spite? Food? For the first time in the interview, the Nakdir blinked. It was an unnatural movement, forced and deliberate like the creature was attempting to engage in an ordinary behavior rather than actually experiencing an involuntary impulse. Responding is mandatory, Researcher Oz prompted. The creature did not react. If you will not comply, Oz's tone grew stern, frustrated, maybe you'd like to see your brand new containment cell. At last, the entity spoke. Research. Research. Its voice resembled a distorted version of Oz's. Research? What kind of... Oz wasn't able to finish his question. July 7th, 1947, the creature said before ramming into the one-way glass and cracking it. As Oz stumbled backwards from the force, the creature collapsed on the ground, seizing and screaming as its abdomen. Get the stags in here now! Oz cried out, but it was too late. A black mass of something shiny and tendril leaped out of the knot deer scuttling around the cell before shattering the window and leaving the empty shell of a deer behind. The Site-44 breach system activated and attempted to initiate emergency containment protocols, but the mysterious black mass escaped its sector, made its way toward the main exit, broke through the glass of the front exit door, and vanished into the shrubbery outside. The escaped anomaly could not be found and recontained. Ever since this incident, there have been a record-breaking number of chronic wasting disease cases identified in deer in the surrounding area, as well as an unprecedented increase in UFO reports. Further research is currently ongoing, but it is unknown whether we will ever truly know what these creatures are. Only one thing is for certain. They are definitely not deer. Now go check out SCP-968 Sleep Killer and SCP-2571 Cracklewood Park for more anomalies that'll ensure you'll never want to sleep again. Wait, is that a deer behind you? Oh, God!